So when we were in person, the way that I had this set up was we, we always have this wonderful understanding that white get the stuff early. So like 15 minutes beforehand, we would make sure that the music was going, that we had some little conversation going, everything was good. And then the meeting starts at six, but then we would take like the first 10, 15 minutes to just kind of like say hello, welcome people, current events, what's going on. Because brown melonade people are going to come strutting in at like 15 after, 20 after, with whatever the beverage is, strolling slowly, taking space. But I love my people. Uh, so let's see. So let's see. Let me see who's on. Tell us all about the amazing shipment of books that you just got, because you just got like eight bazillion books at once. Actually. Was that my key? So I'm, I just loved all the photos and video of everything going on over at the key bookstore. So. Oh, yes. Oh, man. If you guys could see this room right now, just bustling. I can see some of the books behind you. They look amazing. What happened? I can see some of the books behind you. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, I'm trying to make it look better than it looks right now. But. <laughs> I was trying to see the books too. I was Me like, too. Oh. I, that's why I have a turn aside. Wait, I'm like. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That looks okay too. So there's a whole bunch of amazing people. So, beautiful KCC folks who've been doing this for a while, right now, I'm about to ask y'all to look good and act right. So, I've got some friends who have known forever, some beautiful, amazing human beings. So Reverend Lewis Mitchell and Tyler Bro Brodus, ESQ Esquire, are my folks. And they are here, and they are here to run the conversation this evening. So they will, they will tell you about a whole bunch of their accomplishments. These folks who know that Kyler has a Wikipedia page, OK? So that's who I brought into the conversation this evening. I brought some black trans men who've been doing the damn thing for for a while and they've been doing it well and they've been doing it with integrity. Um, and if you know me, you know how much I, I understand and believe in fully the idea of mentorship. And both of these men have been, mentors. they've been mentors to me and they've been mentors to countless, countless, countless children. And we are black and queer and Afrocentric. So young people, y'all's children, that's what you are. Old people, we're old, that's who we are, we are elders. Um, and I wanna make it very, very clear that what we're getting this evening is we are getting wisdom, we are getting life experience, and both of these men are incredibly well-educated and well-versed in, in themselves and, and as well as subjects outside of themselves. So as we're delving into these conversations, it's really easy to believe that you have all of the answers because you've got a feeling and you've got an idea. Feelings and ideas are wonderful and true and real, and there's scholarship, important. And then there's also an oral history and oral tradition. And part of what makes me so happy about bringing these men in is these are trans men who respect their elders. And so, as you're learning from them, as you're bringing, um, as you're, as you're, as you're going to enter in conversation, because this is really is a conversation. This isn't a lecture. This is a conversation that's going to happen. As you step into this conversation, understand that you're getting their wisdom, but you're also getting those who came behind them. And our job, our job, when I'm saying our job, right now I'm talking to younger folks, because yeah, y'all, we're, we're here. But our job is to share our knowledge, wisdom, and folks who are younger than us, your job is to listen to it and push back because we didn't get it all right, okay? So understand we're Gen X and Gen X got a whole lot of shit wrong, but we've got some ideas from that. So. We are here, life is wonderful. Thank you all for showing up this evening. I'm going to be, basically tonight, I'll be monitoring the room. I haven't opened up the Facebook Live. I'm about to do that. Um, but while I'm doing that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lewis. Lewis, introduce yourself, get us started, and let's talk about being black and trans in the USA today. Hey, everybody. It, I'm on West Coast time, so, you know, it's still earlier in the day for me. I invited a special guest to join us who didn't get an introduction. So I want to offer first an opportunity for Octavia to introduce herself. 
uh, she is going to be bringing, hi Carly, she is going to be bringing a perspective that Kyler and I could not bring. Um, so Octavia, if you would just take a moment and introduce yourself and some of the magic about you so we know who we're talking with. Hi everyone, again, it's an honor to be in this space. My name is Octavia Y. Lewis, MPA. Um, I am an activist, an advocate, I am a humanitarian, a mother, and scholar. I am also a Black woman of transgender experience, living with HIV. Again, I say living with, it does not control me. Um, and I reside in New York City. So there's a little about me to get us started. So I want to begin by saying why I invited Octavia. Now, there, I have a whole laundry list of people that I could have invited to join us. But what I really, 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 really wanted was someone who was not about the bullshit and was really about saying how things are, the good, the bad, the ugly, the murky, the ways in which our community is magical and the ways in which our community is toxic. We got all of that going on and we survive it every day. So I didn't want to just, you know, I'm not really about sugarcoating anything. Um, this is 2020, the time of COVID, uh, the time of uh, very visible assaults by power brokers. Uh, these are not new assaults. We've, we've forever been getting lynched and killed by police officers. We just now have footage. Yeah. And, and so when we told you, you didn't believe us, but now that we show you, even though you're asking for receipts, you have more belief. Mm -hmm. I want to say that as a black man of trans experience, I'm not an exception to that. I mean, I get, I sometimes get pushback from black cis men. Well, you don't understand. And I want to share with you, I have never, ever, ever been followed around a store or pulled over because I was born with an F on my birth certificate. Not once, not once, but my mm -hmm. life being a black man means that if I survive the encounter, the ambulance might put me out, the hospital might not treat me, and the jail will not know where to put me if I survive the encounter. But I still got to get through the encounter. So I want to talk about that. And I have one thing that I really want to say during this time that I want us to drill down a little bit on in terms of the nonprofit and political nature of 2020. And I'm going to coin it as sharecropping 2020. And what I mean by that is I mean organizations that add a T and pretend to be black centered to oh. gather a whole lot of money with no relationship with us. They give us $25 gift cards while they get a million dollars in grants. Yep. That's sharecropping 2020. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Kyla, you have a word to share on that? I know you do. <laughs> uh. I'm not laughing at my brother, by the way. He knows why I'm laughing, <clears throat> because I'm not a bullshitter either. I just tell you like it is, and I'm going to tell you the truth and not hold anything back. And so that's why I think I'm here as well. Well, that's why I know I'm here, and that's why I do what I do all the time. Uh, whether I'm in a room full of white people uh, in D.C. talking about the Equality Act or whatever act it is, they don't love me. And whether I'm gathered with uh, activists of my own race, they may not love me. But what you are going to get is you are going to get the truth from me. And so there are a lot of times that... Uh, uh, I've been in discomfort. Uh, I have been, uh, but it doesn't matter. I guess is the bottom line I'm saying to you. I'm always going to carry the message of truth and what I feel is right and righteous for trans people and for black people. Because how I see myself is black first and trans second. Because when I walk out the door on the street, nobody sees my transness. They see my blackness. And my blackness always precedes my transness. They're not going to shoot me because they see me as trans. They're going to shoot me because they see me as black. So when I came out and, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, you couldn't even say the word trans. 
gender or trans out loud. People were whispering it. But I was not going to let anybody beat me down then. And I sure as hell am not going to let anybody beat me down now from wherever they come from. Mm -hmm. And I want to double down on these large non nonprofit organizations that give us the dust and the crumbs while they take millions. People do not be deceived. And sadly, there are many of us that are deceived by a little check of a few dollars and a little picture on the website. Or they take one of you and you go on the website, which I tell people all the time. And I've stopped telling people what to do because they're just going to do it anyway. But they're using you for their grant money. You know? yep. And they're using it to get their grant money, but they're not going to use it for you that this is a construct of a gay movement formed not for us, not by us, and not to do anything with us mm -hmm. or to help us. And oh. so we have to be mindful. And I remember being that little 20 something year old thinking, well, if I just join this movement, maybe it'll change. Well, I can tell you, although I might think I'm 20 in the head, and we know I'm not. Go ahead and laugh, sister, at me, Octavia girl. Because I may be 20 in the head, but my body's not 20. There's not anything that's changed about the movement that I walked into, that I've walked out of now. Because I'm not with the movement. I'm with Kyler Broaddus Inc. And I've said that so many times. Somebody thought it was a corporation, apparently. They sent me something to Kyler Broaddus Inc. But mm -hmm. why I say that is because I'm going to tell you like it is when I get at a platform and just tell you, this movement was not designed for black and brown people. So don't be fooled. And if you see one in there, it's because they're confused and they don't know who they are. And they've been taken because a lot of people will hire me because they think I'm one of those people. But then they get fooled when I get inside because they're like, oh, no, I'm not one of those This can be bought. I'm going to tell you that you're doing wrong and you're going to be upset with me because if you're doing black brown people wrong i'm going to tell you about it and that's happened for far too long in this movement and so we have to be together and not fighting each other with the stuff that colonialism has taught us and you think well that was a long time ago and i know brother lewis is going to drop some knowledge on you and sister octavia is going to drop some knowledge on you and then i'm going to come along and drop some knowledge on you because colonialism ain't no long time ago it's happening right now and we're all complicit to it in some ways but we're going to share some things with you that hopefully you won't be so complicit to it because colonialism is right here happening right now today and lots of us fall complacent to it and allow it to happen for a few dollars but one thing, and I can tell you that, and my brother Lewis knows, because I don't share with many, but I share now with people, is that I'm thankful to be here today. And I'm going to share why. Because that movement that doesn't love me, I've almost died. And mm -hmm. that's been recent. And so now I don't waste any time or breath doing anything I don't want to do. So when I found out this was happening and it was happening, I said, yes, I'll do this because this is not a waste of time to save some brown and black lives from wasting time in a movement that does not love you because we have to do something different and we have to radically listen to each other and radically love each other so we get past the colonialism and the slave mentality that's been planted in our, our people so that we no longer fight each other and we love each other and work together intentionally and radically to rid ourselves of colonialism amongst ourselves. Because we are a powerful people together, but we separately cannot do anything. So there I'll rest and let my brothers and sisters pick up this conversation because I have great faith in both of them. Octavia, I want you to know that, sister. Thank you. I want you to know that as I speak. And my brother knows that from my heart. I appreciate you. And I just want to, uh, Octavia, I want you to address uh, your experience of sharecropping in the modern environment. But I want to also just say here and now, when we talk about Black trans people, uh, we aren't all binary. Um, and so we need to be thoughtful about 
our use of pronouns. Because one of the things that I think is the most hurtful for me is if you've managed to get yourself together to be a part of something that has said that they're ready to welcome you, and the first thing out of their mouth erases you, you know it's all been untrue. Yep. So we need to train ourselves out of things like brothers and sisters, because there's more than brothers and sisters. You can say all people. You can say community. You can say beloved. You can say y'all. We are the most creative people on the planet. We ain't got to be limited by that language because if they come to your door finally and they know you're not welcome, welcoming them and really prepared to welcome them, they're not coming back. They're not coming back. You know, and I think there are ways in which um, we've adopted language from a dominant gay culture that is both binary and it is also about who you have sex with rather than who you are. So when you say lesbian, bisexual, gay, and straight, or and trans, and then straight people over there, you're not acknowledging that many trans people are straight. We're not other. We don't get to, we don't have to go to a separate room. We get to be all of who we are. And you know, when Kyler talks about being black first, I'm not doing first and second. I'm getting, all, I'm all of it, all the time. All of it, all the time. You know, I'm not, I spent most of my life trying to resection myself so I could fit in somebody else's groove. I got no energy for that now. So you either take all of it or you get none of it. And that, that's where I'm living in it right now. So that means that um, I have a saying that I'm, I'm, I'm too big to hide and too slow to run. So you get what you get. The thing is, I, it, it hurts me spiritually to try to bifurcate myself for your comfort. I'm not willing to pay the spiritual price because you can't be kaleidoscopic in your vision. You can pick up the tab for that, but I'm not. Octavia, please give us some, because I know you know some things, because you've been doing some things in the creases of some things and outside of some things for a long time. Of course. I mean, I, I hear your word sharecropping. And, you know, a lot of people on here probably don't know not a stitch about farming. So I call it poverty pimping. Because they actually, like you say, get all the funds. We be the face of it. But we're only good enough to be the little outreach worker, which there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you're striving to be or the little frontline worker. But rarely do you see us in the upper management, the CEO position, board of directors. So I, I, I get that mentality of the sharecropping and the poverty pending. For me, I also have to acknowledge that even myself included, I used to think from a scarcity model where it's only enough room for one of us. You know, they ain't got enough room to bring all of us along. So it's only one at a time now. You know, you wait your turn. I had to wait my turn to get up here. So you wait your turn. But then when you get consumed and commodified, you begin to learn that it's not about a turn. It's not about only one at a time. It's about them using what they can use from you and then discarding you to get someone else. So for me, I had to get outside of that model of thinking that it can only be one of us. And unfortunately, a lot of people that are still quote unquote in this movement were taught under that model. And a lot of them still believe that concept. So for me, I, like I tell anyone, I believe when I'm coming to the table, if I'm invited, that I'm bringing some more people along with me. Because I always tell people, when you're dining with your enemy, they make you be sharp. Because if you got your enemy on the left, you're not going to turn your back to the one that's on the right. Because that one on the right going to drop some in your drink and the other one going to sprinkle something in your food. So for me, it's about being sharp when you are at these tables. But it's also about creating space so that other people can also be at these tables so they can say, hey, you know they just sprinkle some of your food, right? Or, hey, you know they just put some in your drink, right? But so many of us get caught up on, oh, I'm that it one. I'm the one that, 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 that they're calling on. I'm that expertise. But then a lot of us that have been taught a lot of things that are not right, we get in there and we get to spilling that. And, and you're right, some of us still, we get in spaces and it's all about being binary, being passable. Oh, well, I, I'm not worrying about them if that's not what they want to do. 
I'm just talking about me, you know, and the girls that look like me or the guys that look like me. And you don't think about, well, wait a minute, there's other people out there as well. And I agree. We, we've gotten to the point where even a lot of us binary trans people, we've like, oh, the, the, the non-binary people are now coming and they're taking up space and they want to, you know, co-opt the movement. And I'm like, something I'll never forget TTDD taught me was there's always enough work to go around. There is always enough work to be done. And for me, I already told my, I'm already working on my exit plan because I don't want to get burned out and I don't want to become bitter. And if you stay in something for so long and, and you see what we are doing to each other internally, it will cause you to become hardened. And I know me being a, a mother now, uh, you know, and having children, I don't want to become hardened. And I know engaging with, you know, certain folks in our community, it makes me want to become hardened. Now, it's not to say that I want to discard them or I want to discount or discredit them. It just means that I can't occupy space with them. And that's okay for us to say that. And that's okay for us to acknowledge that. Because just like I was taught growing up that all skin folks ain't your kin folks, the same thing with our community. Not everyone in it has our best interest at heart. And it's okay to grow apart from people that you started out with. And that happens because I've done that with a lot of people. And a lot of people have done that with me. And I'm okay with that. Long as I know that I'm going things with the right intention, long as I know that I'm going in a in, in manner that is going to be upheld with integrity, I sleep okay at night. Like I said, I'm not trying to slander nobody. I'm not trying to put nobody down. Like, I don't have to do any of that. And like a lot of us have been taught that the only way we can, you know, stand tall is by chopping somebody else at the knee. And a lot of us still do that to each other. But for me, when I witnessed that, I called them out, or I called them in to let them know what, how they, what they did was harmful and that that's not the way to go about things because someone had to do that for me. So if people on this line don't take anything else away, I want them to live in their authentic truth, but I want them to move with integrity. I want them to know when it's your time to buy out, you buy out gracefully. And that's what I'm getting ready to do. I'm getting ready to buy out gracefully because I know that there are other things in life that I want to do. And as Rev said, you know, I'm a whole being. Yes, I'm black, I'm trans, I'm a mother, I'm all of those things. But I do know within the intersectionality that some of those things take precedence over the next when I'm in certain spaces. Because when I'm at my child's school, I don't think about being a black woman. I think about being a mother and thinking about you not being the railroad, my child. And when I'm in my, you know, activist mode with my community, yes, I'm thinking, like, look, I'm trans. I've seen, like, all the murders. I know the inadequacies that we face, you know, not having adequate health care, not having access to quality, you know, employment, um, housing accommodations. I know all of those things. So for me, even though that intersectionality is there, there are some times when certain sections of me takes precedence over the next because it needs to. But again, as Rev said, I'm all of those things. But again, I do have to highlight certain things depending on what room I'm in at that moment. And that's, um, and I know we're gonna open up for conversation, but that's uh, great, Octavia you know, what you just said, because that's what I feel like when I said I'm black first, because mm -hmm. uh, people see my blackness first. They mm -hmm. don't see my transness, and particularly when I came out. But, uh, but you get all of me, you know, because people would say, well, you're so authentic. And that's the authenticity that right. Octavia was talking about, is to be your authentic self always. And that is not parted in me. You don't get a part of me. You get all of me. And I, I think that's important for people to understand because if you're not all there, then you can't be authentic. And that speaks to what Reverend Lewis was talking about as well, is that you have to be authentic to yourself. 
And um, when we came out, uh, we with him and I, because the Tavy's a bit younger, I might add, <laughs> uh, um, you know, it was a time that people were not coming out and being visible. So we were sort of that generation of the baby boomers, because uh, I know Kamara's uh, a little bit younger too. She's talking about some other generation uh, when I got on here and I was like, oh yeah, she's a little bit younger, uh, but uh, you know, we're baby boomers. And I want to speak to something that else that Octavia mentioned as well, is that people will look at us because we are a generation that's been very visible, but you know what? We have separate lives. We don't live in the movement. And Octavia said something that's extremely important for mental health is that if I lived in the movement every day, I would be in a mental hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, and you cannot live within the movement every day. And because some people saw us and it's because we were the trailblazers, quote unquote, of the movement. And honestly, a lot of our life was lived within the movement every day, but it was different then. It's like there was nothing created. So we were creating the movement and we were working, putting on projects, doing this, that, and the other. And now it's sort of become a lifestyle that's become really toxic for people. And, uh, but we didn't create a movement to live within a movement. We created the movement so the world could adapt to trans people. And people sort of have it backwards and they'll come up to me and they said, oh, well, I want to be as successful as you in the movement. So why, you know, I know you planned on this. So, and it's like, no, that I didn't. Here's what I want to do. And actually I am really doing for my personal success and growth. And they're like, oh, it's like, yeah, I'm a musician and that's who the people I hang out with and that's what I really do. And I'm also a lawyer for real, not on TV <laughs> or for play. And people think that that's what my life is really. And it's like, no, it's like, this is my real life. And actually I've hidden most of my real life from the movement for various reasons. Uh, and that came to fruition of why I hid most of my true life. And, and, um, and my family and even my kids, because mm -hmm. yeah, if anybody was going to hurt my kids, then I would be, you'd be see, visiting me behind bars and Lewis would be putting money on my books and asking Kamara for money and Octavia for money on my books. Mm -hmm. And we've had some conversations uh, and Reverend client confidentiality. Uh, Notice I said Reverend Client confidentiality. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you. I yeah. heard you. Uh, so, you know, when people are going to try to bother my children, it's like, oh, no, they're not, you know. So, uh, but, you know, the reality is it's like, yeah, you've got to get a life that's your groove. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to live in transness 24 hours. And if you ask me that at a conference, you'll never see me again. And I won't lie to you because I disappear in a heartbeat. And they'll be like, where'd you go? Because if you want to sit down and talk about transness with me at a meal, you're never going to see me again. And I won't lie to you because I'll just disappear. And Lewis is laughing because he's seen me do it 20 million times. <laughs> it's like, because I cannot live in that world all the time. It's like you have to have life and you have to know how to navigate other people with, and, and the therapy is mostly about how to navigate other people. It's not really about you and your transness. It's about how to, to teach the world how to navigate transness around you. And that's why uh, therapy is so important. And, you know, um, so that, those are some of the pieces I wanted to say before Lewis kind of opened up. And the other last thing I wanted to hit on in Octavia is so wonderful, the scarcity model, is don't buy into that. You know, and that's what I try to tell people that want to emulate my, my work. It's like, there's so much work out there to do. It's like, if you do want to have a conversation with me, I will entertain one, but we're going to box it in and we're going to set it up. And we're going to talk about all the work there is out there to do. You don't have to mimic anyone or be anyone else but yourself. There is a plethora of work out there to be done to help trans people. And I can tell you how. And it's like, let's sit down and do that conversation. And, and you know, and Lewis will have one with you. Octavia can have one with you. You know, any 
you know, trans person that's doing the work and have one with you. We do that stuff. It's like, oh, I want to be a mini Octavia. So now I'm going to do yeah. everything that she does. And then da, 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 da. That is a toxic situation. It is. Like, you don't have to do that. And go right ahead, one of you, because I hear one and, of you. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Yeah. I would not wish that on anybody in the world. You know, I, you know, I, I really feel like if you want to be, you know, we live in a time when, you know, branding is so important, but what has happened is people are able to use the internet to brand themselves, but there's no there there. Just because you've got internet access don't mean you know how to do shit. It don't mean you work well with people. It doesn't mean that people trust you. And I want to give you a hint. You can't be a leader unless somebody's following you. That far. We got a whole lot of leaders, but ain't nobody behind them. You know, and, and what's hard is that for those of us that are not trying to grab the microphone, we just trying to do the work and we watch people pop up out of nowhere that ain't done a damn thing. And, you know, we don't want to put each other down or, you know, blow each other up and whatnot, but it makes it, it, it makes my ass itch. You know what I mean? I'm like, wait, boo boo. This is not about wait your turn, but it's about do the work. Exactly. You ain't got to wait your turn, but who have you served other than you? And I'm not mad at you for serving yourself, but that's not a campaign. That's not a, that's not an engagement that people should necessarily get behind you. I, I, I can almost guarantee you that if you're doing something worthwhile, even if you're trying to hide, even if you're trying to do it on the low, somebody is watching what you're doing and they're impressed by you and they're following you. You have followers if you're doing something. You know, I, I'm going to tell you a very brief story. When we were doing some work for Trans Faith, an organization that my friend Chris and I uh, founded together, there was a person that hung out at a Burger King in my area. A uh, trans person, older trans person, was at this Burger King all the time. And I would just observe them because all the younger trans folks uh, who were didn't have resources and maybe didn't have shelter, but they always went to this one woman anytime they needed anything. Food, a place to lay their head, a place to get some hormones, figure out how to get out of jail, figure out how to get somebody else out of jail, whatever. They always went to this person. I thought, this person is a superstar. And when Chris and I were talking about how do we support that person with the resources we have, I needed to have a conversation with her and say, hey, look, I've been watching you. You're doing some good things. What can we do to support you? And this is the key. In white people land, that would have meant give her a job in my organization. But that's assuming that she actually wanted a job in an organization. I didn't assume that. My question is, what can we do to support you? Now, you want a job, we give you a job. The other thing is, you ain't got to come to the office because we got remote working. We, you know, do you need some benefits? Is that going to mess up your other system? What's going on? Tell me what you need. Maybe we need to give you a, a Burger King gift card so you can just come here all the time and save your $2. You tell me what you need, but I want you to know that I am watching the work you do and it's powerful. Now, we may never cross, I've never seen her again. I put a little cash in her hand because she took some time to talk to me and I was able to use my resources in that way. She might have moved to another Burger King for all I know, or she was like, who is this random black man coming up talking to me about some transness and whatnot. But you know, the thing is, is that I never forgot her powerful example. And I say this, maybe it's my, maybe it's my pastoral sense, but it's incumbent upon you to bloom where you're planted. I don't care if you're planted in the boardroom or the whole stroll, bloom where you're planted. The other thing I want to say to you is that if you're in the nonprofit world, if this is your heart's desire, this is your calling. If you have not been a sex worker, I want you to make really good friends with one because they will help you navigate the nonprofit world. Because when you're hustling for money, you a hoe. You need to know how to negotiate like a hoe. Name your own price. Don't be a dumb hoe. So get yourself with somebody that actually knows how to do that business. They have more wisdom than you can imagine. They've been doing it for a living and staying alive. Mm -hmm. So don't think that you've educated yourself out of uh, or into an expertise that they have organically. Try to surround yourself with people that know how to do it with nothing 
so that you will know how to do it when you have something. Because you could take a million dollars in grant money and blow it in a heartbeat. You also need to know if you're black and if you're trans, you will have a magnifying glass on every single thing you do. If you spend one nickel on putting some gas in your car because you left your card at home, somebody's going to call you out for it. Now, if you're, you know, I'm not going to name anybody. If you're Joe Kennedy and you say that, you go, oh, my gosh, I'll just reimburse that on my next check. They get to do that. We have a different level of scrutiny on us. So you need to be really tight about how you do what you do. And it's also really helpful to have someone who is looking over your shoulder to double check your stuff. I don't mean that like in a bad way or in a paternal way, but in a way of, I got your back. It's real. Because you're going to you're going to have to always have your receipts. I guarantee you that. Yeah. We don't get to live a receipt-free life. Sure don't. Carry on, Octavia. And, and wait, and I need to jump in on that one. Because yeah. that is that Lewis, you're hitting on some really important shit right now. Because there's there's really a place where you're like, you know, you're practicing adultism and you're trying to tell me, no, I understand what they're going to do and what you're doing is valuable and necessary. And if you haven't crossed all your T's, I'm not trying to white out on you. But if you haven't whited out on yourself, you're not going to move forward. And it's this weird, it's this strange place of like, and, and there, there are places where I find myself questioning myself, but understanding no, baby, I understand this feels like paternalism. I understand exactly what this looks like and sounds. And I've got to just jump you into the game. And, and so that's the language that I've been using, that I've been saying, you know, no, I'm jumping you into this. You need to understand all these white people who love you. Like, like I, I understand that I'm loving this. I'm sitting here and loving every word because those white people who love you and pulled you in and then told you about unpleasant black one who was here before you, but you're so much more amazing and you get it. You're going Ooh. to be that pleasant one and those of us who were the unpleasant ones when you're when we are like riding your shit hard it's because we want to see this flourish and, and we're working towards liberation not towards exactly. subject it exactly. is absolutely i just if you're new to the game in any way know that someone has come before you but they're not telling you who that was one of the things that the nationals do really well mm -hmm. and i'm not going to name them by name you know who they are they recycle black people and trans people and if you brand new and got a little bit of FaceTime, they're going to woo you. Ooh, come work at my organization. We've been, we're really doing great outreach. But they're not telling you about I got a billboard just waiting for your face. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We've already taken the picture. It's in the next fundraising brochure. Yeah. You, they don't tell you about the 25 people that came before you. I will say this to you, and I'm going to make this, make myself available to you. I have friends in my life that when they're interviewing at these places, who shall be nameless because I don't even want to advertise them. They will say, hey, Uncle Lou, I'm considering this job, what you think? And what I will say to them is I can't pay your bills. If you need a job, take the job, but here's what I'll advise you to do when you get there. Exactly. You need to document everything, 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 everything. If they move the water cooler because you got there, write that down. Mm -hmm. And all, try your best to always have a witness because when the truth comes back, it's not going to look the way it looked when it happened. When they tell you that, as Octavia said, there's only room for one or two of you, my question is, well, why are there 38 of you? Because one of you, they're 30, you know, if, if I believe in reincarnation, I really want to come back as a mediocre white man because they just get to do everything. They take a yoga class and the next week they open a yoga studio. Yeah. You know? And I'm just like, wow, that takes some kind of, that kind of entitlement is both um, irritating, but it's also inspiring. Like, I wish I had that kind of self-assurance that said I could do anything. If I walk past a music studio, I can open one next, you know. Next um, week. Yeah. yeah. All okay. Of that is so, so true. I'm just sitting here, like, thinking about, like, examples of what they can do and what we can't do like you were saying the example of using your car to pay for gas and then reimbursing it oh that's fine for them because they can use that word reimburse but for us that'll be mismanagement or misappropriation of funds yeah. and then also if we're in a meeting and we voice our opinion on something now we are aggressor we are the aggressors but if Becky says something, oh my gosh, she's so assertive, 
and she thinks outside of the box and she's a team player. But soon as you, again, come up with an idea that you want to pitch to the team, they'll tell you, well, you know, I think that's a little, you know, outside of the scope of what we want to do right now. And the next time you're in the meeting, you hear the same pitch that you just gave somebody else, but you were told it was outside of the box. But then it's a great idea for them. Yeah. So you're right. So we do have to learn how to protect our intellectual property. Because I yeah. do work for a large health system, not going to name their name. But I, I, I'm, I'm very clear on my intentions moving forward. That if anybody is going to use anything of mine, I'm going to be compensated. Like I say, yes, I will not, you know, I would never shame anyone for doing what they used to do because I used to be a sex worker myself, but I learned many things. I learned my customer service skills and being that because sometimes I had some Johns that were a little cranky and I had to know how to talk to them. I had to know to learn some negotiation skills because you got some that want to cheat you out your money. So I also had to be a financial planner. So a lot mm -hmm. of things that I learned came from when I was doing my sex working. Mm -hmm. Now, the things that I learned when I got my college degree, it taught me how to code switch. And it taught me how to play their games. Now, it didn't teach me how to beat them at their <coughs> games because they're not going to teach you those things. You're going to have to put all your life experiences together to say, well, you know what? Um, this is what they do to get by. Now, mm -hmm. what am I going to do to get over? Because right. get by ain't going to work for me. Mm -hmm. You just like you say, being mediocre, they can be fine. Because what that happened with a mediocre white person and an excellent black person is that that mediocrity is going to win every time. They're going to come in making more than you. Even if you might have been there longer than they have, but they're going to bring them in. Oh my God, we're bringing in this fresh new guy and he's going to really turn us around. But you've been keeping them afloat the whole time. But that'll never be acknowledged. Ever. And I think when you're working in those type of situations or you're in those environments, you also have to be mindful that they have entombed you and where they want you to be at. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to allow you to get outside of that tomb. And if you they're, want, they're going to fight you. Out, right. And if you try to get out of there, they're going to try their best to bury you further. There you so go. Me, it does replace you with right. somebody new. Right. Now, they're they're going to replace you with to. someone new, mm -hmm. and they're going to keep you away from the last one. So there's there's someone who's on this call, and I was actually just back door talking, like, saying, can, can we talk about this? So this person, young black trans person who was invited to the table, right? So after they got rid of all the old black folks, yeah. they invited this person to the table. And this person, of course, like was doing an amazing job at the table. A table filled with lots of mediocre white gay men who had positions of authority, right? And so this young black trans person was bringing real issues and concerns to the table and issues and concerns that the table had never bothered to consider themselves. So they then decided to weaponize their money and their, and their status. So this person who like, and this is supposed to be a, a pride table. This is supposed to be a table where we're discussing how to support community. All of a sudden it's, Oh, so didn't you just buy a new place in P-Town? Let's look at the pictures of your new beach house in P-Town. And when this person came to me, it was like, oh my God, like what the hell was this? Like, just so you know, honey, you just won. Like whether you know it or not, like they just subject, they just let you know that you don't have the ability to bring in as many dollars as they do, right? Yeah. They just let you know that they've got all the dollars. But the truth is you won because you are bringing in information about how to support our people in an authentic and real way. And they were so verklempt. They were so out of their league and how to deal with this because they are mediocre white men who don't have the ability to think this way that they went and pulled out the only Trump card they that they had, which was to use the fact that they own houses in P-Town mm -hmm. to somehow be you and like and that's one of those places where like we need each other and we need to support we need to support the one that new token when that new token comes in being able to put our arms around them and say we need you in that position and they're about to suck you fucking dry and we do but yeah. that token needs to know they're a token and that a lot of times doesn't happen especially in these national orgs you know because one now who's sucking the life out of Two, well, one of them's gone, but one fabulous black person who just doesn't get their token and everybody's sitting on the outside because you can't tell somebody their token. 
and we're just waiting because they're sucking the life out of this fabulous black person. And again, no name shall be named, but it's just horrible, you know? And yeah. uh, again, back to what Octavia just said about there can be a stellar, and I'm going to name that stellar person myself, and the average white person, and they're going to take the average or below average white person's word over a stellar black person's word. Every and, time. you know, while I've almost had the shit, well, I have had the shit beaten out of me. Pardon me. I don't know if I can say those words on here, but uh, you invited me. This so is the KCC, you know, cuss your ass off. Well, I was going to say, well, you invited me, so you knew those words were going to have to come out anyway. <laughs> so so uh, it's just what it is. Like when I get invited to churches, oh, well. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's why I've almost died before it's even my time to die you know, uh, literally. And then they didn't even notice that either, by the way. It's like, because they don't notice when black and brown people are dying. Oh, there can't be anything wrong with you. And it's like, and every black and brown, even my white people that were taking care of me, they're like, uh, they don't notice this. It's like, no, because they don't care. And that's when we have to be aware. And I'm glad you're having this conversation and with people that are aware, like Lewis and Octavia, that are cognizant and care about other people besides themselves and i'm like octavia because when i'm coming everybody's coming and lewis knows that from the past it's like oh no you didn't just invite me because you invited everybody if i'm coming <laughs> wow. and that's what i would do it's like oh you see these 30 people you invited they coming too and it's like that's the way you have to be when somebody invites you in the door. And Lewis always knew that about me. It's like, yeah, they invited me. And he's like, well, they didn't. I said, oh, well, you tell them, boo, let's go. We all go. You know, and that's the way you have to be if you are the black or brown person that's invited. And then they, what they gonna do, turn us away when we show up? Oh, no, they not, or else we gonna turn it out. Uh, and all the news people are gonna be there when we turn it out. And so we just called all the media and we outside the door. They don't want that kind of scenario. Uh, you know, I've run away from Fred Phelps before. It's like, oh, you want everybody out here, Fred? Oh, they ran away from uh, us. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. that's what we have to do and support black people and brown people of color uh, because mostly it's been black people when we look historically at these things because that's who they're targeting and it's anti-blackness and we have to name it you know it's anti-blackness which is what it is and that's what I name it now it's like because you don't have any uh, anti-brown codes out here they're anti-black codes and I was on another call the other day and they're like yeah this wasn't that long and none of this has been that long ago I remember going and getting get the hand put in my face going, you can't drink out of that water fountain. I'm like, and I was five going, what the hell? Of course, I didn't curse them, but I'm thinking, why not? Because this, so we have to get that in our head. Colonialism, slavery, no matter how many pretty words they want to put on it, it's still here, people. And they don't want us drinking out of the same water fountain they drink it out of. They don't want us in the bathroom with us. How many of you have been in corporate America and two of us in the bathroom together and we die laughing because they come in silent. They looking like, what's going on in here? And they think it's really, and they do think it's, and we die laughing and we stay right in there and they leave and they like, oh, they think it's a plot to overthrow the company. And they really do. And it's not funny. And we're in whatever the century we're in, 2000, whatever. And they still think that crap. And you see it outside with this uh, clown that's supposed to be the president and getting away with dirty murder and everything else in between. Now, let, if Barack Obama had touched anybody, you know, he would have been locked up and all on his way to jail in less than 60 days. Uh, and this man has done everything and, and, and more. And we, I don't even like to talk about him because that gives him too much power. And I definitely don't put his face on anything or mention that person's name. I'm like, whoopee, that thing or whoever that person is but as much she gets out of me as the clown. But so therefore, mm -hmm. you know, they hold us to a higher standard than they're holding this idiot being the president. And as Octavia said, we misplaced a nickel, uh, we go into jail. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it does, we, and we also need to get out of colorism. 
because I ain't got no other privilege, y'all. I don't care how yellow I am or how light I am. When I do get that privilege, everybody's going to know because we're going on a cruise, everybody. And we ain't going back to Africa either. We're going on a Bahamas cruise and have a party. And we're bringing our black asses right back here to show him we ain't going nowhere. So uh, yeah. uh, that's what I'm talking about. So I, I want to revert back to something really quickly because I, I want to talk about how we live in, in community with one another. Because one of the things that we've talked about is how the mediocrity of whiteness can overshadow some things. But the thing yeah. I want to say to you is that everybody we're talking about is not cis. Becky and Aiden will do that too. Mm -hmm. yes. You need to know that. You need to know. This is, this is not just specifically about cis gay people. Uh, if you'll notice, one of the nationals is, is really excited because they've hired all these trans people who all happen to be, not all, who primarily happen to be white masculine of center people. So they feel like they're really doing something. Because mm -hmm. they've got Aiden spelled five different ways and you know, all the, you know, everything else. Aiden, Hayden, Shaden, you know, the people. And, and so, and I ain't mad at them, it's a lovely name, but I use that to, to make a point. They will invite you in and they will sharpen your pencil down to the eraser every day and throw you away. This is where it gets really tricky because then they'll set it up so that Kimora and I are both there and they'll whisper something in Kimora's ear and whisper something in my ear so we're not talking to each other. We need to break that. We need to have like, you know, I need to send a little text message that says, Yo, Cam, meet me at Starbucks at 7.30 tomorrow morning. We just need to talk before we go in because they're trying to do some bullshit up in here. We ain't got to let everybody know what we're doing, but we need to be in communication. And I'm talking about the backdoor channels. One of the things that's really disturbing right now is that we got Instagram and Facebook. We just blowing each other up. Blowing each other. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to step yeah. in it. But that public platform, that, that performative anxiety, that's some bullshit. Because at the end of the day, we're the only ones we've got. So if we throw each other away, what are we doing? Yeah, We're, we're not playing on our own team when we're throwing each other away. We're going to fight. We're going to disagree. We're going to mess up. Yeah. You're going to be, I mean, I have had people get in my inbox and say, uh, Lou, can you give me a call right quick and give me what for? And I take it from them and I listen to them because I know they're not trying to hurt me. I trust that they're telling me shit because if you, if you care about somebody, you're not going to let them walk around with spinach in their teeth and toilet paper on their shoe. You're going to pull them aside and go, yo, dude, you got shit on your shoe. I'm going to need you to fix that before you go out. You know what I mean? Like we do that for each other. We've forgotten what it feels like to be uh, cussing cousins and, and, and to step in the back room and have a conversation and then come out like we ain't never had that conversation because we ain't letting everybody know. That doesn't mean that we keep things secret. It means that we understand the difference between being in community with discretion and with honor and respect and putting each other on blast so we can seem like we're the holy one. Kamora, you were about to say yeah. something. Now this, this morning I was on, um, what do you call it? I was, uh, someone from the advocate was interviewing me. And it was this wonderful place where like, I cannot tell you how excited I have been that this was gonna happen tonight, the way that it was happening. And that person was asking me what we were doing. I was like, well, you know, there's this amazing kinship network of black queer people throughout this country. And, and those are, are and Lewis, I heard you. I heard you on the gendered language because I was saying my brothers and my sisters, okay, so my brothers, sisters, and then sons. So my folks, like, like, having these wonderful places where Monica Roberts, I know, so she just texted me and told me that she's like trying to get on right now and hopefully she'll be able to get on. But knowing that I've got those touch folks around the country, being able to say, can we talk for a quick second? Can we touch base on this? And hey, this is getting ready to happen. I need you to know this, this, and this. I know that you're gonna be on this call. I know you're gonna be in this meeting. This is some backstory stuff. So like in Philly, when the, um, when the folks who had the attic, when they were going through their ridiculous so their, their executive director was that nice middle-aged white lesbian who was practicing white supremacy in, in the way that only a special social justice warrior, white middle-aged white lesbian can do. You know, they, they did a great job of reaching out to all of the black queer folks working with kids throughout the country and making sure that we all kind of like 
were able to have each other's back and able to hold each other in a way that was that's necessary when you're in this nonprofit war. And and I say it that way, and it's interesting how that lands on different people's ears. But as as us as black queer people are inside the quagmire of this of this nonprofit war, we've got to know each other and have each other's backs. And again, and like re, right here, knowing that I needed to have the black trans conversation and knowing that I needed black trans people to hold this conversation and knowing that I could reach out to my folks to do this. Which means you have a relationship with people. Like the hard part is you can't reach out to people if you don't know nobody. You have no relationship. So you reach out to uh, that, that person with the name who you've never met. You haven't vetted them with community at all. And I'm going to go someplace here that may be very unpopular. And I might be in trouble, but it wouldn't be the first time. Folks pick, you know, that local superstar that has not been vetted by anybody in the community. And you pump them up and then they come back to the community where they haven't been vetted or have a relationship, like they've done something. And we're like, we don't even know who you are. Like, where, where did you come from? I also want to back up one quick second and say, Octavia, when I talk about being a, a, a street hooker, I'm actually talking about my own experience. I was a hoe too. So I, I, this is not something I read about. This is something I lived. So I, I went, I was, a, I was a prostitute and then I promoted myself to a pimp for a couple of years. All of this came before sobriety and before ordination, but this is my story. Um, like I don't, I, you know, I wouldn't talk about sex workers from like uh, a theoretical position. So I need to say, you know, been there, done that. And, uh, you know, often when we're talking with trans women, they assume that trans men haven't had some of those similar experiences. I actually had a conversation with a, a woman at a conference who was just giving me what for. You don't understand what it's like to suck dick for a living. I'm like, oh, contraire. I kind of do, though. So maybe you ought to ask some more questions before you make that assumption about me. You know, I mean, there are things that we don't talk about, but you need, if you ask the questions, you'll get an answer. If you make an assumption, then you operate on some things. But, and I don't have a college degree. I have a high school diploma, half a bachelor's, half a master's, and a lifetime worth of student loan debt. But what I learned along the way is that the books that I would study, I need to write them. Until I write them, you can't teach me more than I know about me and about my journey and about the people around me. It doesn't mean I can't learn other things. There's a certain discipline in academia that I look forward to learning. I'm was just on the phone last night, matriculating. I continue to keep trying, not because the paper is important, but because there's information and a discipline that I want for my own personal growth. Not to impress you, but to impress me. I want to impress my own damn self because I have it in my mind that I want to leave this world as Reverend Dr. Lewis Mitchell. That's my personal goal. That ain't got nothing to do with what anybody else wants me to do. Um, I want to be proud of my own self because I, I've sabotaged my own self. And I'm saying these things aloud in this group because we also get caught in secrecy and shame and we can't tell each other that we have shortcomings, which means we can't get support and we can't get healing because we're too shamed to say what's really happening. I'm going to go ahead and be the example for that and tell you I got all kinds of shortcomings and shame and I'm still great and I'm still grateful and I'm awesome. And I'm going to tell you, as trans people, specifically as Black trans people, we are, the, we are the most extraordinary people to ever live. We have created our own selves out of something that only we could see from the inside out. And we have brought that to fruition and lived to tell the story. There is nobody, there is nobody more magical and magnificent than we are for time immemorial. The first person who was a Gentile who was baptized to become a Christian was an Ethiopian eunuch. Don't let anybody in Christianity tell you that you wasn't there first. Don't let them use that book against you because we're in the book. We're represented everywhere in every culture and every spiritual path. We are the chosen ones. So the fact that people have convinced us that somehow we're on somebody else's bandwagon is some bullshit. I'm hoping, here comes Monica now. Monica can tell you the history of who we are in this country and beyond. If you've been taught that we are somehow inferior, that is a revisionist history, don't believe it. We are extraordinary. We've always been extraordinary. We will always be extraordinary. If we can stop exterminating ourselves 
and if we can really stand together and stop people from murdering us, particularly black trans women, um, that means that those of us that are blendable, that appear to be cis black men, need to interrupt that bullshit every time we hear it. Because we hear it Octavia, in the barbershops. Octavia's had something to say here for a while with us. Yeah, go for no, it. I'm just, no, I'm, I'm, you know, sucking up all the goodness. I, I'm, I'm nodding my head. Oh, okay. I thought you did. <laughs> Monica, Monica, Monica. Yes. Can y'all hear me? What's up, sis? Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Always. Yeah. Well, just, Monica, I just pumped you up as being the resident historian. So tell us some wonderful things about Black transness in history and in your life. In my life, basically, I've been doing this activism stuff for now 21 years as of the 30th. So, and... Um, met many of you wonderful people, <laughs> you know, so we are literally making, you know, so despite all the negativity, we are making history. Um, we have uh, two history makers sitting on the Minneapolis City Council right now in Philippe Cunningham and Andrea Jenkins. So they are the first African, out African-American trans folks elected to public office uh, since Althea Garrison back in 1990. So, and they are part of the 27 trans elected officials that we have across the country right now. Mm. So, so, you know, despite, you know, the obstacles that have been put in our path, we are still accomplishing and making, as it not only uh, accomplishing many things, we're making history as we're doing it. As always. I want to I wanna offer the opportunity for people to have a word or ask a question of Octavia or Monica or Kyler or myself. Um, and so I'm going to preface this by saying, um, I'm going to open this up. I want to leave a little bit of time at the end for everybody to have like some parting words. Um, and those of you that are having parting words, Monica, Octavia, Kyler, Kimora, I want you to think about um, the one thing you would say to someone that reached out to you and said, I really want to do this work in community. What's the one thing I need to know? So I just want you to plant that in the back of your minds. That's going to be the closing. So I want to open it up for folks that have questions or comments or whatever they want to say. Um, I just have one thing to say. Um, I know we all have done some things, myself included. Um, and, and, and I do believe in growth. And I do believe in righting, you know, wrongs or whatnot. And I can honestly say, putting on my own big girl panties, that there was a issue that happened between Monica and myself. And I just want to step up to the plate because I know I reached out to her and I don't know if she got it or not. But I want to, you know, own up to my wrongness um, and the way that I spoke to her and the way that some things I said was disrespectful. So that I know that I can own. Again, it was something that I had to wrestle with and some things I had to sit with because again it was some things that transpired there but for my part what I can own what came from my mouth I just want to say I humbly apologize to her for that um, because again once you realize certain things I also realize that we can't dis discount discredit or discard one another whether or not we agree or disagree there's a way about going about it and i think that incident that transpired between me and monica years ago was not the way to go about it so for that i just want to you know humbly apologize for her and again i'll just leave it at that I feel you there. And that that's, those are those places that we carry each other. And those are those important places. Um, 
Lewis just walked away for a bit. And again, we're, we're opening this up, up. And I wanna say thank you so much. Like that's, let's just open it up. So Raven says, to be honest, my entire experience in the LGBT world has been negative just in the way I've been um, treated by people. And Raven, thank you so much for bringing that up and, sh and sharing that. As I think that's something, and it's interesting that as we get to this part, so many folks have, have felt the need to turn their screen off because this is that place of, we can call it the place of shame. Um, yeah, we can, we can definitely call it the place of shame, um, but it's, it's that place of gaslighting. And I wanna leave it there because it's that external place where we're here and we're trying to do, yeah, Raven. So, um, so th this is the beautiful place that's happening right now. And if you're watching this on Facebook and if you don't see the comments, Carly is, is wrapping Raven with love. And Raven is doing what we do all, all the time. And Raven, baby, you know I love you. So this is where this is coming from. Um, and Raven is doing the, oh, no, it's cool. I'm a big girl. I got this. No, you know, like it comes with territory. And one of the things Lewis said is, what is the one piece of, of advice? What would you say to this young person who says they want to step into this? And one of those things is they're not going to like you. You know, they're, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to definitely be places where you are going to be laughed at. Um, and, and it's really nice to get to a place of saying they're laughing at you because they're scared of the truth that you're bringing, but it's not fun to be laughed at. Um, and Monica, you, you came on here and we love you. And I, I know that I'm not the only person who depends on you far, far more than is fair to you as a human being. And we depend on you. How do you take the hits? When, when the world comes at you, how do you take the hits? Well, um, the incident that, the, let's say, for example, that incident in Chicago, and that was at uh, Creating Change in 2016. I'm on here, Monica, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Brother Kyler, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. That, that was, in general, it's, you know, in general, I'm basically going into it. I've been, you know, I have a thick skin. You have, you, you have to be in this for 21 years, you have to kind of develop a thick skin. But there are some times that there's stuff like ha what happened in Chicago that just, you know, is above and beyond what you, you know, what your tolerance level is. And, but, you know, for the most part, I know that I have, you know, say, I have an entire community depending on me in some case, you know, say, to, you know, to advocate for, for them. Uh, their last, you know, last session, I went to Austin nine times, you know, for various, you know, say, and to testify for and against bills. Um, and it's just, I have, you know, it's just, I have on uh, over, you know, say over these 20 years, I've just kind of developed a thick skin. Um, I know that there are people out here that cannot stand my guts and I could care less whether they do or they don't. The bottom line is I'm in this because I want to leave a better world and better society than what this community looked like when I first started doing activism in 98. And, and I'll delta uh, since Monica and I were at the same event and they were really actually attacking me and Monica got uh, involved and as a good sister would do. And I think she was unduly treated uh, very unfairly in that whole situation as we all were. And that's when you have your own community coming down on you. It wasn't just the LG or B movement, it was the T part of the movement coming after you, or something that was totally misunderstood and it was just pure hate. Um, and for me, uh, it was part of my event and, um, and it had been a long road to get there and it was just yet a series of attacks that I had experienced 
uh, and um, it was about, for me, a lack of communication from, it's unlike what Kamara is, uh, Kimora is doing here, where she has young people listening and trying to build that bridge between young and older people are, and we're not so old, by the way, it's a little sore spot of mine, but we're not. And, you know, I feel like particularly in the LGBT movement, people like to make that age so wide. Whereas I teach in the real world and my students don't make that age that wide. They just don't. They want to see me out if I'm in their city and they've actually left the university. They're upset with me if I don't go out with them. They call me and they go clubbing with me. And so I find it very interesting that that dichotomy uh, is more prevalent in the, and it's always been when we used to just call it the gay movement, which is now the queer movement, and how we dissect ourselves and divide ourselves even more within the queer movement. Because I haven't been in a classroom in seven years, but even the students that haven't met me that know of my reputation, they want to party with me. And so I find it very interesting that when I go to gay events, there's this divide, uh, or queer events, there's this divide. But when I'm at non-queer events, there is no divide. My students are down with me if they see that I'm in the city, which I don't often broadcast because I don't want to go out because I'm exhausted dealing with the LGBT event. Uh, and if they're not LGBT or T, they want me to go clubbing with them and I can't do all the extra stuff anymore. And so I find it very interesting how there's such a difference and then how we subdivide ourselves in already a divided community when we should be coming together. And so that's what I'll say to that. And, and then the people attacking us at that event that Monica was at, there was no need to attack. That was again, uh, us finding ways to differentiate ourselves and not love each other. And we need to, I go back to Lewis, you know, I, you know, we've always find, found ways to differentiate ourselves. When Octavia brought up, you know, us attacking or the non-binary, non-binary is not new. If you talk to trans men my age, we've all done it. We've been non-binary. So that's funny that then some people in the community think that's new and non-binary has been around forever. There is actually nothing on this planet new that we are doing. Uh, and so if people would read a few books besides watching movies, and I hate reading, by the way, I always wait for the movie to come out too, but I've read a few books because I had to be a professor. And it's amazing when you read a few books, you find that there's nothing we're doing here new, including a la sex too. They was doing it all kinds of way, way back in the day before any of us were thought of. So that we think these things are new is interesting and that I've been through trends of the movement where we've done all these divisive things as Brother Lou has and we've seen them. You know, none of this is new where everybody wanted to divide into their own little sex. None of this identity politics is new. It's just how are we going to handle it? And mine is I've never been about divisiveness. When I was fighting, when we just called the word transgender, that included everybody. And what we spend so much time doing, and I'm going to shut up because I don't have much time, but is wordsmithing. But we don't spend time loving each other. We spend so much time wordsmithing and blogs and attacking each other. Where's the love? And I'll leave it there. Where's the love? The love is here. Oh, it's here, brother. I you know, it's, it's hard to find and it's hard to mine. And, and I will say this, you know, I often offer, I mean, each of us, Monica and, and Octavia and, and uh, Kyler and Kamora and I are all very different people with very different personalities, but we gel around a sense of truth and a sense of honor, a sense of transparency and a sense of integrity, which means we love hard and we fight hard. And, you know, we ain't always seen eye to eye on everything. And that, you know, we, we've forgotten what it was like uh, back in the day where you just go toe to toe. And then when the bell rings, y'all go have lunch. Like, ooh, you kicked my ass out around. You want coffee or tea? Because it, it ain't that serious. At the end of the day, we still have each other's backs. You know what I mean? Like, that's how we do. You know, we, 
those of us that grew up in community, uh, in the communities of black folks, and it's not exclusive to black folks, so I'm only gonna speak from my experience as black people, you always had that, that crazy aunt or uncle where you know you, you know, don't sit on Uncle Jim's lap, don't leave on such and such next to the silver. You still yeah. invite them, you, but you know how to keep an eye on them. You, you, you know, know, you just know, realized, you know do, right? You know how to do. You just know that's that's your family, right? That's and you true. just like, okay, you know, crazy such and such lady over there. You know, she can't drive, and you can't leave her around the brown liquor unattended for too long because you you know things are gonna get crazy. So you got to know what you know. That doesn't mean you throw people away. It also doesn't mean that you take out. There's certain places that we can't. You leave you alone, Louis, though, because there's certain places at a conference where we know that if we leave, <laughs> leave you alone. Certain things are gonna happen. You know, I will say that since I've been booed up and since I've been sober, they're less likely to happen. Okay. Uh, now that I, now that I'm booed up, I'm a little bit less of a hoe. So that that takes one of the, takes some of the pressure off of y'all. Um, but okay. good, that's good to know. I'm gonna have to call you Octave and find this news out, girl. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, so the, the reality oh, okay. is is that. We know what we know, and this this kind of put people on blast culture. I mean, one of the things that was true back in the day is that we all had each other's backs because we had one place to go. It wasn't like there was like a bar for left-handed lesbians and a bar for people who wore leather chaps and a bar for people <laughs> with, you know, a nose piercing. Like we didn't have all, we didn't have every little, you know, silos. We, you know, when I came up, we had one bar that people of color went to and eight oh. bars that white people went to. Right. Mm -hmm. exactly. And so when you went to this one bar, you were there with gay people and, and, and trans people and drag queens and hookers and, and the, you know, the yeah. attendant to the board of supervisors and, and your closeted uh, deacon and everybody, everybody went there because there was only one place to go. Right, brother. That's and so, right. you know, it was what it was. You didn't go up to church and go, hey, deacon, you know, you didn't really tip the bartender the other day. You just kept it moving. And you might have taken the deacon aside later and said, you know, I'm going to need you to uh, stop with all this bullshit you're saying on Sundays or I'm going to put you on blast. You know, there, there are ways that we knew how to do uh, that really required that we actually allowed each person to kind of fill out their, their personhood. Like we aren't, we have nuance and we're perfect. I'm not, I may seem super outgoing in this group, but I'm really not. I actually don't even like people very much. I like persons, like individuals, but groups of people. And the older I get, the crankier I get, and I, don't, I like people even less. But what I do care about is my superpower is my availability to the community. If you email me, if you call me, if you Facebook me, I will get back to you. That don't mean we're going to be close friends and you can't non-consensually adopt me as your family. But I will get back to you and I will support you in whatever ways that I can. I'll even tell you if I can't support you. But I'm not going to leave you hanging. You can't reach everybody because that's not their superpower. Everybody's got to do what they do. Find that thing that you do. I see you, Nicole. Jump in. Yep. Nicole? Can you guys hear me? I can hear can you, you now. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, boy. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me now? Okay. Yes. Hello? Can you still hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. Um, so I've been sitting here the whole time trying to uh, figure out when I was going to jump in. Um, there's, I'm actually kind of nervous. There's so much education and experience. Um, here, uh, I feel like I'm I'm one of those people who who, who want to do the work, um, who have who has been doing the work in my own way, and um, I feel as though I I I need more education and. It's been for a long time that I have not had the people. I have not known the people. Like you guys were saying that you have to know people. Um, and I have not 
been put in this in the right place. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling a little bit because, like I said, I'm nervous. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking for resources. I work as a therapist, and I, that's how I, I give back to the community is to be able to assist with mental health um, and to be able to provide those resources. But I, I also am looking for resources so that I can always expand my knowledge. Um, right now, I am working on, I'm starting a group, uh, but it's going to be gender expansive uh, uh, young adults. But I would like to be able to focus more on that. Um, but, you know, really learning to understand. Um, so I guess for me, I, I'm, I'm offering it and learn more information. Hello? Hello? We heard most of that. Your bandwidth is low, but we could piece out absolutely most of it. Yeah, no, Nicole, if you, oh, sorry, speaking of, speak with you. I don't know if there's more that you want to say. Um, your bandwidth is, makes it a little hard to hear, um, but you know we're here for you. I want you to continue if you'd like to. It's a little better. No, not really. Uh, maybe can you can you try to type it in the chat? Not better. No, it's still pretty warbly. I think your bandwidth is low. Can you try to type it in the chat? William suggested that if you turned your camera off, we might be able to hear you a little bit better, Nicole. But I think one of the things that Nicole was um, talking about and asking about was that she's putting together a group and that she needs more resources. So, and so knowing that, and right now we're in a strange place, we're in a very strange place with COVID, which means that we can't always go out and visit other people and bring new people in to come be a part of what we're doing. I'm sorry, my, my son is on the phone doing this stuff, but he doesn't phone. Can you guys hear that? Uh, I'm making it stop, I'm doing everything I can. Give me a second. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. There we go. Um, but resources are incredibly important for those of us who are like, when, when you've got to work with folks who are not you, it's incredibly important that you educate yourself on those folks. And books are incredibly important. Original source material, meaning folks, meaning actual people, is one of the most important things. And one of the things that we discussed earlier was again, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a black bike, so it can appear as if I should be, I, so it can appear as if like I'm an adequate and the right person to be hosting tonight's conversation, but I'm not because along, along with being a cis woman, look at this shit. So I'm, gen, aside from the fact that there's a big ass man who lives inside of me and don't fuck with him because he's gonna come out and kick your ass, aside from that fun piece, I am the wrong person to run, to run that meeting. And then once we get into those spaces, there are times when I have to be. And I think one of the most important things that we have to say when we're there is, let's discuss the disgustingness of this. That for whatever reason, this, we all understand that we all need to be here today together, doing this together. And I'm the best that they had. I'm, I'm so sorry, this is Kennedy. 
and and you've got to and and but 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 do it with honesty don't pretend that you're walking in there and you can do just as good of a job as any trans person could because you can't and the place where it's beautiful and honest and real growth can happen is when you go in there and make it quite like there is not a more honest place to be than to say this has to happen i'm the best that they can come up with and i am not adequate I am not adequate, but I am here. So let's let's move through this together, um, and that's incredibly important. So that so that needs to be your step in. From there, you can grow and and you can take these people wherever it is that you need to get take them because you have gone in with the honesty. Yo, sis, that lady, wrong person. You're all they've got. Let's figure out how to do this. Hi, I just, I entered late, but Kimora, I absolutely agree. Um, what we're all probably seeking, just because I, I started with uh, her conversation, her piece, is we're seeking those safe spaces, but we also have to re realize as being a part of the LGBTQI plus community that we aren't adequate. And once we speak that truth, then we can start having conversations amongst our community, right? And, um, you know, and there's a difference between um, being a white trans individual and being a trans, a, a, a person of color, a black trans individual. There's two different struggles that are going on there, right? So w once you step into those spaces, you have to figure out um, where to, how to make people feel safe. And it depends on what kind of spaces you're trying to step into and what kind of, what you're trying to um, recognize within that group. Right, and and it's and the LGBTQI community itself is is a patriarchal community, a white patriarchal community that we have to recognize also, because from the '60s and beyond that to now, white cisgender men have um, dictated how we go about doing things and, and the orders we do things in, and now we're trying to to develop these voices, these uh, BIPOC voices in our community so that we can have our own safe spaces and, and, and find a way to be amongst each other, as well as having our those same type of allies within our community, right? So I, I agree when you're stepping into the spaces to be honest that you don't know everything. You don't, you know, we don't know everything. We know our experiences still, and we try to know our community's experience. So once we, you know, step into these spaces, we have to be open and honest and be willing to taken information from each other knowing that we do not know it all mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's it and that's yeah and that's a big piece of decolonizing these spaces and understanding like when i first stepped into this work i found myself in these strange places because i was representing gay ink right i was representing large american white gay america and i was walking into black spaces and i was talking to black folks who if i could have met us in black space we could have moved way faster here you know like fubu we got it you know for us by us nothing about us without us we understand that completely however we're coming in from this like white gay patriarchal white supremacist standpoint which says I, as the gay person, am the authority on absolutely everything. So just take me into your room and allow me to run all of these conversations. So then as other folks start to step into our work, they really have this idea, well, anyone can do this. And there are just completely the wrong issues being brought up. So, so the place that I would go to very often with young folks, and they want to talk about, you know, supporting young trans folks and like just across the board it just is what it is white black puerto rican everyone's the same we're going to support all these kids the same because trans is what it is and everything else is ridiculous and and i would just quickly go into okay so what are the conversations you're having about keloids at which point the white person in front of me looked at me like i was 10 karat crazy because they didn't know what that word meant and we realized that we were not on the same level we shouldn't be having this conversation Let's pull way out. At which point, the black person in the room all of a sudden realized, oh, I've got a place to enter this conversation. Oh, there's a place in this conversation that I have worth and I belong here. So guess what? Should you be leading the conversation? Nah, uh-uh. Do you have very important information that should be a part of this conversation where we're here together? Yes. And I will say, and I am, it, it's a strange place, but again, look, looking at the people who are here, a lot of these people built this inside of me. 
if you want the truth, if you want to know how to deal with people, deal with Black queer folks. We know we've been doing it. We've got the answers. And our answers do allow places for other people to step in. But our answers also make it very clear. There are places where we belong and you don't. And there's places where you belong and we don't. Absolutely true. I want to be a respecter of time, um, not only because I have deadlines later on today, but also because it's later where a lot of you are and you may want to actually enjoy some of your evening. Um, I want to move to the question, the closing question of what is the one thing that you would say to someone? Um, and I want to leave a question behind for you to consider when y'all when you're talking amongst yourselves. And it's been something that's been heavy on my mind because I'm currently working in an organization where and everybody in the organization is trans and the people that are giving me the most vexation right now are two of the three black people, trans black people that are in the organization who have been super disrespectful. Um, I think their ideas are great their their performance of them has been really personally hurtful um and so i'm not you know trying to throw them under the bus i'm actually trying to love them but i'm also feeling like if i'm trying to lift you up and you keep kicking me in the chin uh, i don't know if i how long i can hold you there you know and so i want you to think about how we um how we engage one another in conflict in a way that means that the next day or the next year or the next month or the next engagement we can actually look each other in the face and do some work together even if it's only you know one thing so the question i have for people is what's one thing you would say to someone who came to you and said i really want to do this community work i really want to do this activism I really, I'm, I'm that person. I'm ready to do the work in the field. What's the one thing that you would offer them uh, as an inspiration or something to think about? And I'm going to go first and then I'm going to shut up. I would say to you that if you do not have a resilience plan, don't do it. You need some people in your corner that will pull you up short and tell you the truth, that will love on you hard, that will keep you together, that, you know, when you're flying high and you're full of shit, they'll say, you know what? Nah, boo. I understand. I, or, or they'll ask you the question, hey, was that for effect or like you really feeling like you all of that right now? Because let me help you with that. You need those people in your life. You need your kitchen. You need your kitchen group that you can go in the back room and have some real com conversation and come on out like everything's fine. That's what I would say to you. Um, Monica. Um, the advice that I've actually been giving to folks wanting to start the work is figure out what exactly you want to do. Is it lobbying legislators? Is it, is it simply doing at, as a, um, um, talking to, you know, say talking to folks one-on-one -on -one and uh, walking them through, you know, say walking them through the uh, transition process. Um, being, being that advice, you know, whatever, in other words, find a lane that fits your skill set, that fits your particular skill set and, you know, and stay and stick to it. Um, not everybody, you know, not everybody is uh, capable of being able to lobby because, you know, because you have to get a lot out and say maybe no more than 10 minutes. Uh, there are people that are better at media. There are people who are better, you know, in one on one conversations. There are better other folks who are better in group or one on one. Say, so, but there's enough room in this movement for everybody to shine. And that's, that's something that we need to remember. And is it, you know, that, you know, that there, we're not operating from a place of scarcity here. There's a, there's enough work for all of us to be able to do a, a part wherever we are. And, you know, 
and there still will be work. Even if you take a break <laughs> from it, the work will still be there when you get back. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, I get it back to what you're saying. So about finding your niche, and I think part of part of the issue is when I kind of came in and started working with the population. If I felt as though, okay, you know, do I do I qualify to work with this population because I'm not out rallying, I'm not out protesting, you know, I'm not doing all these things. And I, you know, I am newer to the community, but I first took interest um, about 2016 when I was at the True Colors. Yes. Look, Nicole, we yeah, lost you again. Answer. So for the group, you know, I say that you know, our group is going to be from recipes to relationships. Basically, me, you know, we're going to be talking about culture, but we're also I'm sorry, and Nicole, I lost you after you said you were going to be talking about culture. What else are you guys going to be talking about? you know, thinking or portraying as if I know everything, but really learning more from the group and the individuals that are participating in this group. Well, one, one thing that I think is incredibly important and that I did, um, and again, knowing like as, as I was working with queer teenagers and the queer teenagers that I were working with were young people who are in out-of-home care, and making it very clear that that one of the things I could definitely offer was space for them to develop the relationships that they were going to have and that they were going to need over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and so I look at Monica and Lewis and Kyler here, and these are relationships that I need over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and so as you're pulling these young folks together, what can you give them? You can give them each other because mm -hmm. the world is going to attack them. And the truth is, they're a cohort that's going to to experience attacks that we don't understand. Like, mm -hmm. um, and at some point, Carly, if you can talk a little bit about what our athletes are going through right here in the state of Connecticut, because there is a very real war and attack on. They're going after our trans high school athletes. So that so that that's that's what the attack looks like here in this state. Um, and if those girls didn't have each other, then they would be in an even worse position. And it's always great to have allies and other people who look at you and say, boy, you're amazing, but don't quite get it. But being able to create a place where they have each other and they can support each other is, is one of the most important things that you can do in that position. Right, right. What I've been kind of learning when I was getting to the point to where I wanted to develop this group is that there is a, from what I hear, that there's a lack of resources or um, group experiences for just that, that, that age from 18 to 24 when you're really trying to figure out, you know, am I still a child or, you know, am I moving towards adult? So I, I'm trying to focus in that area um, and that's, that's where I heard the need is. Um, and I just, does any, is anybody else hearing that? That there's a yeah, lack of resources for already, that age group? Nicole, and you said you're already connected to True Colors, correct? I am, I do, yeah, I'm connected to True Colors. Um, I also, I did uh, my internship, I did it with Carol McKenzie for a year, so um, I do have some experience in that area. Uh, I'm Connecticut, so, I'm here, so yeah, I'm I am jumping, connected with you're talking colors. to people I love, and you're talking about white people who understand white trans issues, mm -hmm. and understand right. people who understand issues coming from a much different perspective than, than many of our kids, so, so this, is, this is why the KCC exists, and this is why this conversation is happening this evening, the way that it's existing, and I, I would just like to ask the folks on this call, in what ways might learning how to deal with a typical white trans teenager not translate well for our children? 
Right, right. And that's and that's part of the reason why, you know, I, I kind of came on here because I do want to connect to other people. But um, I don't want to say unfortunately, but that's kind of where, where when I was trying to engage in a population, that's kind of where it led me so that I can be high enough in the platform to, you know, gain that type of experience is I, I could not find, you know, anyone at or I didn't know how to find anyone, um, you know, black or brown that was working with the population. Um, and I didn't know how to, to kind of go about integrating myself um, with them. I would say right now, so we exist, we're the KCC, and we are black and queer and Afrocentric and unapologetic at all times. The New Haven Pride Center also has been doing a great job at providing programming and getting out of their own way. And, and if you look at what their programming looks like, they are not the facilitators if they are not the right people to be the facilitators. And they're also working well at making sure that they're paying an equitable wage um, and facilitator fee when they're bringing the other folks in and the right folks in. And one of the things that Lewis spoke about, that 18 to 24 year old age group, we can talk about, um, I am Hartford, I know you're, you're Hartford, I can tell you that there's a phrase, opportunity youth, I hate the phrase opportunity youth. That is, that's just a euphemism that's not necessary. But a lot of our trans babies between 18 and 24 are selling their bodies in different ways, many, many, many different ways in order to pay bills. Many of them enjoy it, it makes them happy. We need to be able to figure out how to create space for that and real space for that, not space that understands, oh baby, how horrible that you got to do this and what an awful thing that you got to do and we're gonna support you through this. But own it, you're making your coin, you're paying your bills, you're taking care of your friends, this is where we are. Um, and that's a reality that very often our nonprofits don't want to step in. And that's where that disconnect comes from. So when we talk about that lack of services, oh, we're doing this, this, and this, but are you really creating spaces for their lived experiences? And until we've got stipends that are like $55,000 a year, we cannot go policing what our young people are doing to pay their bills or, or judging. And you can try that. It's not going to be effective uh, and you're going to alienate them, but good luck with that. <laughs> Kind of what I learned working. That's kind of what I've learned working agencies. You know, there was a lot of times where, for me, advocacy came in the form of um, just kind of talking to some of the higher up administration agency about the importance of the work that, um, that needs to be done. And so many times, you know, I get, oh, yeah, that's great, that's great. And then nothing else ever happens at that, after that. So now that I'm working more and that I'm working in private work, then I'm able to actually offer that, those resources without the restrictions. It sounds like this is a, a, a conversation that needs to be continued regionally so that you can get both the support you need and also so that you can be supported and doing the work that you care about. But I think that there's some regional resources there that are available for you through the KCC and other places that I've mentioned. And I think it's important to note that there are black and brown people working with young people all over the country and all over the world. We don't get all the press because we don't get all the money, but we're, we're still doing the work. We've always been doing the work. We continue doing the work but you can get connected up by people in this group. They'll give you all the resources that you need. Uh, where do we leave off? Kyler. Thank you. You're welcome. Kyler, what words? There we go. Kyler, what, what words of advice would you offer? Oh, words of advice, because I forgot the question. Um, in regard to organizing or what um i think much has already been said in that regard you know find find what works for you uh you know feel out different things and i think we've given a bunch of cautionary stuff ahead of time but there is so much work to be done there is no one way to do that work uh you may find somebody that you think you want to role model but keep your mind open there's so much to be done out there and there's so much that hasn't been unearthed out there to be done uh, that it just amazes me what there is yet to do 
uh, if I were a much younger person that I would take on. Uh, uh, and it's what's stopping me now is not my age. It's uh, little men and women in white coats that are st stopping me. And I am listening to them now. Uh, or I would undertake so many more things. So there's lots and lots to do. Don't be discouraged by what you see because in a blink of an eye 10 years ago, there wasn't this much stuff. And in a blink of an eye 10 years before that, there wasn't this much stuff. Um, I remember dreaming and thinking there would never be these many things in my life. And there have been and more. Uh, for some of us older activists that are, have been around for just a minute or two. And so there's so much yet to be done that your imagination can only dream. And I saw Lewis type in, and I do believe that all things are possible. I was on a panel uh, last week. There have been so many panels through the month of June. I don't know when I've not been on a panel or off a panel even, but uh, my air supply seems to be good. I like to throw in dry, dry jokes to see if you're paying attention to. Depends from being a professor in a classroom. Make sure you're paying attention. But the reality is one person said to me at the end of the panel, I'm surprised you have so much hope. And people always say things like that to me because while I bring you truth, I always bring hope. And that we have the power to do so many things within our own hands. And I do believe that because if we look at the ancestors whose shoulders we stand on, they did so much with so little and they were so brilliant and that didn't take a book for them to do that. Our ancestors were brilliant people and I and you stand on the shoulders of our ancestors that were brilliant people. And look how we stand out now just on the shoulders of them. And if we take one scintilla of what they gave us and live off of what they gave us, then we too will be brilliant and make so much of what we have. And I see it, I see it in your faces here and the faces that don't want to be seen, because that's okay too, and I want to say that for you, that don't want to be seen, because there's power in that also, and that is okay, as Lewis will say, and it is okay, because there's power in all of you, and I feel your power, and I love each and every one of you, and there's so much we are going to do on this journey uh, Lewis is not done yet. Monica is not done yet. And where's my girl Octavia's hiding on me? Oh, she dimmed the lights. I'm up. still here. I know you still there, sister. I feel you. I feel you. And 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 uh, our girl who bought us here, uh, Kamora. There's so much energy we have, people. Just the five of us, or however many we're counting. And with all of you on board, we're gonna blow this out <laughs> you fill in the word there okay and thank you all for being here because there is so much follow that bright star kamara she is a bright star she has powers and if you're with her you're on a magical journey and follow us people because if you're with us you're on a magical journey if you're with reverend lou if you're with monica if you're with sister O. Who's over there, Lady O? You are on a magical journey because I've seen all these people in action before. And we're not done yet because we have much work to do. And it's because of you that we continue this work. So thank you for letting me be here and feel your presence and power, people, because you are powerful and you keep me going every day. You people. So thank you. Reverend Lou for awesome. convening this and thank you all. Octavia, you're up. Sure. Um, what I would lead to someone is definitely find someone that is willing to pour into you and unleash your gifts and not trying to make you in their own image. Um, and 
on that note, I'll just leave you with the words of my mentor, Avery Wyatt. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm. Well said. Cam, it's back to you and you're the last voice. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure in my otherwise dismal day. So uh, this was my treat for the day. I appreciate you. I say. You know, I always have a yes for you, Kamara. I say I go. So, yo, yo, thank you so much for coming. And, and you all just said everything there has to be, and you guys are here. Is, and so you prove what my final words always are. So my final words to anyone stepping into the work, the first thing I tell them is write a letter to yourself right now about why you want to do this and then put that in a book that you're gonna own forever. You know, So I work with a lot of social workers. If it's the DSM, put it in your DSM. If it's your family Bible, put it in there. But whatever that book is, put it in there. And once a year, revisit it. And the year that you find yourself sneering at that person and rolling your eyes and no longer believing that person, that's time to go step out and reevaluate. So, so do that, stay true to yourself. The person, the person who, the first person to hold you accountable is yourself. So you, you've got to figure out what your integrity is so that you can hold yourself accountable to yourself. Um, but then find your actual peer counterparts around the country. So for me, there is, so the youth program that they do at the Ruth Ellis House out of Detroit, integrity. I keep my eyes on what they do. I respect their work. Um, the Attic down in Philadelphia, I respect their work. I keep my eye on what they're doing. Those are people. And then actual human beings. So as y'all are seeing these older, older in my age, like in my peers, those folks keep me accountable. Outside of that, younger than me people hold me accountable so making sure that i've got folks who are a little bit older than me a lot older than me a little bit younger than me a lot younger than me making sure that i hold myself in the middle at all times and i've got i've got folks um and i will say that houston monica houston you and ashton i had a young person a couple of years ago you remember a young person who was relocating around the country and he was going off to houston and he again he's one of my kids so he knew, hey, Miss Kamara, I'm going, I'm moving to Texas. Oh, where are you going in Texas? Why are you going in Texas? They're going to kill you. They're going to kill you. I'm going to Houston. Okay, I know some folks there. Um, and I said, no, so these are the folks. Find these folks. There's place. The green book is real, and we need to operate in that. And we need to connect ourselves. So, so A, first place of integrity, self. Figure yourself out. Figure out peers who are doing the same type of work as you, and then peers who hold your integrity. So as Lewis said, we don't agree on everything. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking of some of the most amazing arguments at conferences and realizing that in some ways we are the problem children. And when it comes to the black, the black queer national movement, there's some other who are way better Democrats than us. There are others who tell the party line just a little bit better than us, but they need us and they like us and we work together. Um, and and so, 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 so knowing who your folks are Knowing, knowing who the different folks are to work with, and then finding that activist in history. Um, and so me, I will, have my, I, I will have my Josephine Baker days, and knowing that my other activists in arms understand that I'm not talking about wearing a banana dress, right? But I'm talking about, I gotta keep taking more of these kids because I gotta keep taking more kids. I gotta keep doing this fight. I understand that they see, like I understand my cover is blown and I gotta keep this fight up. So, so between really Ida B. Wells, Josephine Baker, uh, um, and, and of course, you know, Sojourner Truth always, because always, but, but finding those folks as my touch. And that's the only way you're gonna get through it because there are gonna be people who have your back. And if you are working in the integrity of self, there are going to be times when those people who have your back, if they're working integrity, they cannot visibly have your back. And that's an important thing to know that, that as all of us are figuring out how to do this well, the person who's always there with you, no matter what, that's your road dog and that's cool, but that person isn't holding their own figuring out your role, figuring out how you fit in and moving from the place that you fit in. Um, and, and integrity keeps coming up, but that's really, that's really all it is. And knowing that, okay, education is incredibly important, incredibly, incredibly. I'm in no way trying to take anything away from integrity. But in this work, knowing those who came before you and those who are doing the work is in many ways more important than the degrees and knowing what the fights were. Because when you're stepping into this, you're stepping into a fight that people have been having for a long time. And thinking about what happened in 2016, and people who I know and people who know other people on this call, ask us for real. Like, like when you've got a couple hours, ask us what happened at Creating Change 2016. 
um, because th those are conversations about a shift and a shift in the movement and a shift in who is taking care of the movement and everything about everything about that. Um, but we need we need to have each other's backs and we need to be prepared for the moment when no one likes you. And people, like it's amazing like, like that conference. I love to talk about how yeah. So they took all the art supplies that were provided for them by the conference. And they used all those art supplies that were provided and created all kinds of signs that in no way under, made it clear that they in no way understood what they were upset about. And then they went off and they were upset and loud about it. Um, and, that was, and that was cute and interesting, but it in some ways let me know that we were jumping into a more Eurocentric way of doing this than an Afrocentric way. There, there, was, there wasn't a respect of elders and of elders. Like, like if you can disrespect an 80 year old black trans woman if you can respect a 60 year old black trans woman and somehow think that you've got any leg to stand on no matter what then you and i there's a place in morality that we just don't meet if you can't if you can sit up and and so, so trees over here like actually trees, you want to share so trees over here painting and if you can in any way speak about stonewall or any of those who came before us and then come out your face and disrespect an older sister who's who has somehow gotten on a plane flown across the country and shown up to be there for you then 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 this is i don't know what we're doing in this movement if we can't respect those who came before us i'm not sure but yeah so tree you want to talk about so tree is over here creating art because this is like kcc and this is what happens you want to talk about what you're going about Yeah, but I'm still working on it. Uh, Marcia, did it just for you feel me the conversation and everything going on today? I don't know if I did it right. So it's Marsha P. Johnson on a spray paint can. Oh, let me get you. Wait, you running, running? Okay, in the back of the car is the canvas. So yeah, and, and say hi to Ann, because Ann just got over here too. Hey, peace out. Yeah. And so yeah, and just create spaces for folks who are going to do what they're going to do. Like if, if this couldn't be a better example, so Tree's over here creating art, and Ann's over here getting a canvas to go create a space to go create her voice and send it out in the world. Um, but get in where you get in and figure out how to share your voice and do it authentically. Because like you, you can step into my words, and, and I wonder, like, Monica is loud as heck, and she gets out there and she transgresses it out and does that. Be safe, doll. I'm loud as heck, and and I always wonder when people want to step in my in my shoes and do what I do, because this is cool, but it works for me, and because this is this is what works for me, um, and I and I thrive, I thrive in it, but not for everyone. Wait, I'm sorry, who the occupant ate with me? Louis, what are you asking? I'm sorry. No, that that was a. <laughs> I'm uh, talking about y'all's president. I'm like, I, I don't have one of those. I don't I refer to the <laughs> occupant in that way. He, yeah. He's just the occupant. He doesn't get the other title. You know, there, there, there's really a part of me, a small part of me that's scared that if he's voted out, this, this swell where people appear to care and are starting to do stuff will go away. That like all of a sudden we'll have something else and and that will disappear. So that's that's a lot of, when we think about what these conversations are and what I'm trying to do here. Yeah. Creating a place for us to really have this this base of people who continue so that no matter what happens in November, we're still communitying it up. It's gonna be a shit show no matter what happens, because even if for some reason uh there is an election that is allowed to unseat him, and these are all, you know, some maybes because there's a lot of variables here. The people who will be the most upset, who are already upset because they have to wear a mask and live with people of color and actually not tell us what to do and ask us and question our every movement, they're going to be, I mean, we are in a place where um, the, the lines have already been drawn and there will be more violence and there will be more heartache and all of the people that are in the middle of the road are going to be shoved to one side or the other or run down. So if you're on a fence, you know, enjoy that for another few minutes because there will be no fences. There will be no fences. The most middle class, milk toast, toe in the line, 
black people are going to be on one side, the other, or run down. There will be no middle ground um, because this person who exemplifies white supremacy on steroids and all that support him are going to force the hand of everybody that doesn't that wants to be a peaceful, angry people. The hands will be forced. There will there will be no middle ground. So uh, either either you know people will be in the streets or people will be providing underground railroads and other things for people in the streets. Everybody's going to be doing work or triage because that's all that will be left at that point. Well, and he's not going to go quietly either. So if he loses no, he's not. So I'm, I know that I can't be in the streets because my disabilities won't allow that. But I'm all about providing triage. Yeah, well, I know I can't be either anymore, so, uh, but I'll be providing legal services to get you out of jail. There you go. All right, I got to go back to work because, you know, the white people that run my organization expect me to return in some reports so that we can get the money that we can do the thing we do. Thank you all for your presence and for your inspiration to me, and I'll see you on the other side. Reverend Mitchell, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. And and we don't have to shut down right now so we can stay here and continue the conversation a little bit. Um, and I would like to ask, so we've been talking about what that advice is. Yes, Adrian. I wanted to, to, I wanted to give the advice too, but I wanted to piggyback off of what you were saying about get in where you fit in and the energy that you have that people aspire to be, you might not just, you just might not have that type of energy that might not be who you are exactly. And it's okay not to be that. And when starting my um, organization, my point was to repurpose my anger. So repurpose that internalized trauma that you've experienced, re repurpose those things so that they come out um, in your activist vision, in, your, in the way that you become an activist. And also to recognize that not everyone is advocating for the same struggles. You might be heading toward the same goal, but they might not have the same exact struggles as you have, right? And in and, 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 and different ways. They, and you have to be able to open up and listen to those people. You have to be able to recognize either you're an activist or you're not. Either you're willing to accept people's struggle and trauma and help them and help yourself process it, or you're not going to be able to do this work. And and that's where I, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I didn't mean to like, like jump in, jump in, but you're right with you because you have your many, your many identities that you go off of and that what you feed off of and not everyone can have those same identities. Right. So everyone has to find their space um, to, to do the work and to accept that about themselves and not try to, it's not about pushing yourself harder to be someone else, be yourself in this work. And that will take you so much further. Thank you, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah, no, no, like this morning I was talking to, so I just see Jeff Curry's on here. And I was talking about, you know, the Karen activism or Becky activism and just loving watching what, what privileged white women are doing right now and really loving it because it's their activism. And we've all seen people who are not activists step in, like something happens and it pisses them off and they show up at a rally and they're angry and it's great. And then they show up at the next rally and someone pushes back and they're like, oh my God, there's pushback. We expected pushback. And then that's the end of it. Then they, they are not comfortable showing up anymore. And so watching, watching these angry white women figure out how to do a fight from an angry white woman's perspective, that gives me all of, the, all of the faith in the future. Kyle, you can laugh as much as you want, but we need to talk about some of this, this like, this no, Karen. No, I'm not disagreeing. I'm not laughing <laughs> at you. Don't do that. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm agreeing with you. Sorry. Yeah. No, but it's just, it's just beautiful to see what it looks like. And there's like, I've talked to some folks recently, the TV show Mixed Dish. There are places where I just laugh. So like most people here know that I've got a white mother and a black father, right? So I'm mixed. In this show, and, and I was a teenager in the 80s, and in this show, the kids are teens in the 80s. And there are just certain things that Rainbow, the oldest kid who's the daughter that she does, that are just embarrassing to me because I kind of roll my eyes like, so is there really just like a, a is there really a mulatto way of doing things? Is it, yeah, I guess there kind of is a half breed way of doing shit because our activism around the place looks the same. And so, so just understanding that. And, and doing what fits for you makes sense. I'm like, so Tree's over here painting. Tree is like six, seven, and a black man. It's 
you were to jump up and down in the street yelling and screaming at white people the way that I do, he, he would have died years ago. So yeah. I understand the privilege of my size, my gender, everything that goes along with that, and know that like my ridiculous ways of being, a big piece of it is because of the package that I come in that allows that to happen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Raven, he is adorable. He's got pretty eyes. Oh, that must be tree. I haven't seen yes. tree. So. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, I to totally get, and people have to understand what packages they come in as to how they can advocate, you know. I see his peace flag mothers used to love to use me before, you know, I was so uh, obviously out all the time. And I'd go to the state house with them, and then they, we would play a game on the legislators. And then I would walk into the office with them and they'd be like, oh, well, I've never met a trans person. And then I'd be in their office for like 30 minutes with the P-flag mother. And they'd say, well, yeah, you have, like he's one. And then they would run out of the office and then I would chase them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get ah, yeah. that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> and then of course I love touching them because they're like, it's like black, it's gonna rub off, so. Yeah, Dawn and I pulled that stunt we pulled that stunt uh, when I lived in Kentucky, where they were trying. There was this other, this new, other newbie activist that wanted to talk to her state legislator, and and way that the Kentucky capitals, uh, let's say, hearing rooms are set up, they have dual entrances. So we knew he was going to try to duck out of the other entrance. So Dawn and I parked at the one entrance, and then when he tried to duck out of the side entrance, he ran into his constituent. <laughs> <laughs> so see, these are things we've done on legislators before they even knew like we really existed, and there were so many of us, which thank mm -hmm. God there's really so many of us now that we don't have to duplicate ourselves, thanks to you guys. <laughs> And and people, sorry to be so gender specific, but yeah, no. Well. So. But being able to use that and know it and own it, and there's I don't want to say it's political correctness, but 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 there's come a place where where we can't, where we don't, where we're not as comfortable using ourselves and using exactly what it is that we bring. So we want to talk about, you know, we we celebrate diversity and all this stuff. It's like. No, but please understand what we've got. So there's there's a group here in Connecticut right now, that's, <laughs> right? And and so it's a young black trans group. They did the Juneteenth. They did yeah. uh, um, the Space for Everyone. They did the Trans March. They're doing all this good shit. And they've got this 21 year old um, black trans girl who you know. So she's got the pretty passing privilege, and they use that shit and to watch the entire crew understand and oh wait and then they've also got the cishet um black boy right and it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun watching the black male leaders try to pick him off and it's a lot of fun watching watching the black male leaders learn that samaria is a trans woman and and but then watching the brilliance of these young people who figured this out and figured out how to use it to their advantage it's just i just go okay okay this this has got to be okay because you understand that you bring a power that's going to throw them off and it's going to give you the advantage. So rather than trying to do this, like, no, take your fucking power and run them into the ground and use that shit. And, 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 and the cishet boy is awesome because everyone talks to them. They had a meeting with the mayor last week. Guess who they looked at? Guess who they tried to talk to throughout the entire thing? The cis man. Not speaking at all. Yeah. Yeah. And that's horrible, but I do agree with you. I think that we were taking ourselves too seriously at this juncture. And instead of using things to our favor, that we don't uh, use these things to our favor. And uh, when you can, we should, because I always take advantage of that. And I used to do it at every training when I go out to your training <laughs> and I still can sometimes get away with it as long as people don't go on the internet uh, and Google my name before I do a training, I still do it all the way through the training and I'll let them own all their biases and whatever. And then at the end, 
I'll say, so, you know, and then, and then we'll say, so, you know, what were all those biases about, you know, transgender people and I'll let them own them. And I'll say, well, what if I tell you I'm a transgender man? And then they're like, because it helps dispel all that BS that they've stopped at, which is BS. And they realize that people are people. Exactly. And Don't try to reinvent the, the, tra uh, the, the power of, uh, reinvent the will of power, right? You just yeah. want to just go ahead and use it against them at this point. Go ahead, keep talking, keep talking, and here we are. What do you have to say now? So I think Bingo. it's wonderful. Bingo, exactly. Because you're trying to reinvent something that's not even there. Okay. Yes. And we're already here. And it's, we've been here. And then that's what I tell them. And it's like, so, uh, and you don't know how many trans people you've already met or that have been, you've encountered in your life. And that's oh. what I tell them. And I can't wait until we get a hard stat on it because there's more and more of us cropping up. And you just hit it, Adrian, uh, right on the head. And that's it. Because they've met more trans, as we know the number of trans people that grow, they've met more trans people and have encountered more trans people than they've ever known in their lives. So, and that's the hot spot. That's why I love to do it with them <laughs> or on them. And that's why it's so funny to me because it's so stupid on their part. It's like, oh, now you want to back up from me and run away, you know? And so that's why I love chasing them. <laughs> so sorry, it becomes a pastime of mine and actually a colleague of mine, which I can't divulge his name either, but he's very important to the movement and writes lots of legal briefs. But, but we do it uh, even when we're alone and without other people on purpose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's just ridiculous that you've clouded up in your head like we're some kind of, you know, whatever. You know, like what, what could we be, you know? Uh, like those little alien some Martian, from Martian, you, you know, what is it that you think we are? So... It's, well, it, Lewis is a Martian. Shh. Lewis Mitchell is, is a Martian. The rest well, of us he, are people. Lewis is special. Well, don't tell anybody because I'm a Martian too. Wow. <laughs> it's so stupid, you know. So all of it is, and that's why I like to do trainings like that. Like we just did, I did one yesterday. Yeah, and we drove up. And actually the person picked, I'm doing it with a small, a small firm. And they picked us because I was on the training team. And then I kind of found out because two of the worst people with the worst stuff then chose me as their one-on-one -on -one between trainings. And I was like, oh, I must have got like, oh, and I got three of them, but two of the people with the yeah. deepest problems. And I found that all three of the people that chose me had trans people hidden in their closets. Oh, I like you. And I see your face up there. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> you did my face when I was doing their one-on-ones and they couldn't see my face. I was like, oh, now I know why they chose me. Cause it's like, it came out and their little, you know, bias things, you know, and they wanted to know where they were and they were actually trying to be good. They were just in fear that they had some biases and they actually had none uh against the trans people but they were in fear that they would and so they chose me they got to choose their person their teacher mm. trainer but they all three purposely chose me and one was just out and out about it because she goes well i don't want any biases one she had biracial grandchildren so you know she picked me because she thought i was biracial not nah, but uh, I appear to be, you know, and I appear to be any race that people cho choose on a given day, it depends on the cab driver. Um, <laughs> and it does, and then they tell me I'm their race, so I go along with that too. And then, um, and then they, they knew from my history, because I don't hide, I've never, uh, Kimora knows, and, and uh, Monica knows, I've never hidden that I'm trans. I've never hidden that at all. And so it's in my bio. So that's oh, why they chose me. Oh. And then yeah. two of them came out. One, or we already knew, had a trans person. Oh, can I just and then the one? other two came out telling me they had trans people in their lives. So, but they, none of them wanted to be biased. And honestly, none of them were, surprisingly, with where they came from and what rock they lived under. And I don't mean to make fun of people because I'm from a rural place too, but they really live under a rock. So, 
and I'm done talking because we really need to respect old people's time. And it's late where I am. And I, it's late where you are too, actually. It's only uh, 7.20 here. Well, I think it's 8.20 on the East Coast, Monica. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, these, these go, we, we run our mouths. So like these are, so the, the one of the ways the KCC works is every night we do one of these. And these go where they're gonna go. Honestly, since May, they've been just black. And every conversation has gone, no matter what topic we've attempted to put on it, it ends up that and black. And, and that's, that's where we are and that, that's a wonderful thing. Then we also have these conversations. So we've got the members and we do these for members and those conversations aren't on Facebook and those aren't like, those are very, very, very private because that's when people are talking about their stuff stuff. But no, we, we end up staying out here, having a good time. It's, Again, like when, when we were before, you know, can I swear? Can I be real? You better be, because I I did what? 15 years in nonprofit hell. I spent 15 years of halfway supporting my people and not being able to do all of it because of the funders and the white superiority and all that other good stuff. So here, there are times when this conversation goes much longer. No, you can't. You don't need any matcha. Um, but these conversations just go longer because they're not allowed to happen everywhere. Um, there, there ends up being that place where we need to kumbaya. And so when we were talking about who's qualified to run a trans support group, a cis person is not qualified. That's just, just across the board, period. Does it happen? Yes. Are we saying that there shouldn't be groups because the right people to facilitate them aren't there? No, we're not saying that the group shouldn't exist, but we are saying that in order to do these groups in a responsible way, we need to admit that we have the wrong people running these groups. Um, and, and that's a bit of why these conversations can go a little bit longer sometimes because those, those are important conversations to have um, and getting people to that and getting the person who is that person is the wrong person in that position to figure out how to responsibly be in that position. That, that, those conversations take a long time and we, we, these rooms get filled with people who are in those places and can have those conversations. Well, I'm glad to assist anytime. It was nice visiting your group. Uh, you know, uh, you're always good with me, so saw you doing this and glad to jump in. So you, ha you have wonderful folks here and it's nice to be in this space. So thank you very much for uh, having us. So. Now, did you figure out your Venmo or your cash app? Because we have, again, like, please Google, please Google Lewis Mitchell, please Google Kyler Brodus who again, let me tell you, my man has a big old long Wikipedia fucking page, okay? So yes, he's got a beautiful website of his own. There are a million citations. He is, if there's an important queer thing that's happened, he's there and he's got a Wikipedia page. Monica Roberts is a mother to us all. She's an auntie to us all. She's a conscience to us all. And she's amazing. And she's here with us this evening. So please Google the folks we've got on here tonight figure out how to get dollars into their pockets. Um, because if you believe what I have to say, and if you think that I've got a strong and amazing voice, Monica, Kyler, and Lewis, we have sat at those conferences. We, when I say that we're the troublemakers in the black queer community, we have sat there together and being the troublemakers and all of that power that I've got. Monica- 20, Yeah, 2012, yeah, yeah 2012, uh, I say uh, Out on the Hill was a prime example of that. You remember when I asked the question of the dead AIDS policy czar, uh, has there been discussions at the senior policy level uh, about uh, pulling trans folks as a, into a separate category and out of the MSMs? And remember when he told us no, then oh, Kyler jumped in, Lewis jumped in, <laughs> you jumped in. Right. You know what I'm oh, no, no, no. We are going to. No, 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 no. How? Yeah. Right. Then, exactly. Yeah. Valerie Spencer came. It's a Valerie Spencer. And I still laugh about when Valerie Spencer stood up in the back of the room, put her hands on her hips, and went, Do I look like a man having sex with a man? <laughs> <laughs> At which point I was like, Yeah, no. Mm. Yeah, that, that White House, and then, yeah, so I'm like, and I'm just Mind like, you, everyone understand that this all was happening in the White House. We were in the White House. That, that's yeah. where we were acting this. Like, we were, yeah. we were Black, queer, and us in the White House. It was a right. And yeah. telling it like it was, or like yeah. it was. 
we're not now we're banned from the White House, but you know, there are plenty of us still working in there. He didn't yeah, I don't want to go up in that nonsense now. I don't want to go up in there either right now. Well, he, I'm, well, I'm he like I want to go in there, but of course I would never come out with a lie. So that's all I'm going to say. No, next time I'm stealing the toilet paper for real. <laughs> I'm stealing the toilet paper next time. Right. So, well, I can't go up in there so cuz I'm not going to come out. So, we know why cuz Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But anyway, but, moving but on. Yeah, that that was fun. I said, yeah, it's, it's like I've told some of the young ones. I said, there are times when it is actually fun to do stuff. Because yeah. 20, 28, well, the 2019 session, well, I said, which was last, is which was the was last year here, you know, because we only, our legislature, thank God, is only in operation on even in odd numbered years. So, mm -hmm. um, I was headed to a state legisl a meeting with a state legislator, and with a guy that runs Texas Values, Jonathan Signs, is well known within the advocacy community that the only reason that he's in anti-LGBTQ work is because his wife left him for another woman. Oh yeah, we've got one of those here. So I bump. So I see him. And Dave Welch, another one, you know, who runs the uh, Pastors Council, Texas Pastors mm -hmm. Council. Yeah. And Dave Welch is rolling his eyes at me because I basically eviscerated him in a debate during the hero fight in 2014. So, so he still feel, he still feeling, he's still salty about that. So I see both of them and I go, hey, Pastor, hey, Jonathan. And I said to Jonathan, how's the wife? <laughs> <laughs> and when I walk you off. You know you ain't right. <laughs> hey. You know you ain't right. I love hey, you, brother, but you know man, you ain't the, right. The man has you been trying right. to oppress. Hey, the man's been trying to oppress us. So, hey. you know, hey. I didn't say I was mad at you. I didn't say you ain't right. I didn't say, I didn't say, I didn't say, I didn't say, I didn't say I was mad at you. Hey, oh wait, geez. Carl, you turned on your your camera. You're here. Hello. Well, guess, no, I'm no, I was listening. Like I've in. been I've been saying. So you do I said, I was like I've been saying, I said, I do not have to be nice to my oppressors. Well. Mm -hmm. Well. No, I've been no, I was out. No, I've been I've been in between calls at work in between listening to this thing. Yeah. Well, we got a break coming in. We got a break a little bit. So I want to say, Monica, you know what? I, I love you for it. But you know you wasn't right. <laughs> I love you for it. Don't get me wrong. Hey, I know it too. But still, it was fun. <laughs> still, every so often. I, whatever I said, whatever you you do to throw them off their game, you do it. Because <laughs> they that's true. Because they do it. They try hard to do it to us. Yeah. Because I've. They, I've because every time, as you call them conserva fools, whenever I'm in a forum with them, the the same thing they always try. The first thing they always try and do is misgender you. Yeah. And and my thing is like, no, that don't work. <laughs> that don't work. That'll just make me want to whoop that ass even more. <laughs> no, the tactic I've been using lately is when they try it, I flip the script back on them. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's, it's amazing how fast, how mad they get when you misgender them. Mm hmm You know, that's, or, or like, you know, what did you say, ma'am? Huh? That's it. Or, yeah, I had a, I say I had an incident about last, last year, I was minding my own business. I was, I was just out and about, you know, so I was putting some money on, a, on my, and, uh, just and this is one of those where I had literally just left from a panel discussion. So I'm dressed to the you know, I'm dressed professionally. You know, I'm I'm in a great mood. I didn't got paid for this event, so you know, I'm really in a good mood on this one. And so this woman gonna say loud enough to where I can hear it. And I'm like 20, 30 feet from her. That's a man. And then I turn around and say, what did you say, sir? I'm not a sir. I'm a ma'am. I 
I said, it's hard for us to tell right now, sir. <laughs> and she went off. I mean, she just, I said, I said, she, I said, it's funny. They love to dish it out, but they can't take it. They can't take it when you flip mm -hmm. it right back on them. Conserva fools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. I'm happy though that enough people are trying to punk them though. Because there have been yeah. in just too many years of us being respectful and trying to yeah. meet love and kindness. Yeah. And you can't. There's there's a certain demographic that does not respond to love and kindness. They respond to this. Yeah. No, especially a, especially these confet these Connecticut Republicans. Uh, no, Carl, we need Texas no, we, ones too. Mm, Texas we ones need too. we need to embarrass no, we need to read them to filth daily in this yeah. state. Yeah. Yeah, Texas ones are the same. Yeah, because it's so I don't know if you saw it. really it's it's at that point. So so someone, I'm not gonna say him, but someone who pe okay, because he put it back on now. So Jeff Curry, someone who a bunch of people pay who are not paid for, but a bunch of people end up voting for. So he's representing us and he actually turned his camera on to go give us some some thumbs up and some clap on that one. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, you. Are Thank you Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. We, we, I'd like it very much if the Democratic Party in Connecticut clapped back on them for the way that, they're, that they, are, they are demonizing trans youth in this state to raise campaign cash. You know and I know that's bullshit. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know and I know that's bullshit. Absolutely. Ain't yes. right. Yep. It no, ain't it's right. Not. It's not, and they're never going to hear otherwise. And, and, yeah, because basically they've made it. They've made it their mission to basically use us as their wedge issue for 2020. Uh, and the, the other thing is, we just have to clap back on them. Um, because well, you know, I, yeah, you know, I've I've had that as I've had that attitude for a while here because our idiots, you know, say. So, our our Texas Republicans are just off the have been off the chain since 1984. So, oh yeah, yeah, they they it's like, so the rest of the country is starting to the, the mimic them. Do you have, do you find in Texas do you have allies on that side of the aisle? I mean, we're fortunate in Connecticut where I'm not going to paint a broad broad brush of all Republicans and say that they fall into these categories, but we're looking at a lot of. People I am. <laughs> hey, you can do it. You know, I, yeah. So, I, I, I used to work with a lot of them yeah. on a daily basis and know that they don't agree with that. They're not going to clap back how they should, though. I'll give you that, Carly. Um, yeah. Well, they well they need to. Yeah. These, are people's kids. No. these were people's kids, and these were young black children, Jeff. In, in terms of, in terms of, and the Republicans in, you know, say, the Republicans here are a different breed from up in the, in the Northeast. You know, they are racist. They are, you know, they are racist, homophobic, transphobic, ignorant. So no, we 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 don't coddle them. We don't coddle they the, them. Monica, they the, they the same way up here now. They learn they learn from they learn from Phil Graham and Bill Clements just up here too. Mm -hmm. There's no Edward Brooks in the Republican Party up here no more. No, no. So. They basically chased all the moderate Repub all the moderate Republicans left in Texas, left uh, and either became independents or eventually joined the Democratic Party here. So because they got run out of the they got run out of the party by the Tom Delays and the Louis Gomerts and stuff for, you know, of the world. Mm -hmm. What did Mickey Leland say to him once in the Texas ledge? Y'all some evil motherfuckers. <laughs> Oh, you did. I no, was on C. I was on C. That he said that on C-SPAN. I remember watching that. Yeah. Looked at him, pointed at, pointed out. Like I think it was delay. Graham said, "Y'all some evil motherfuckers." Looked at all of. Them. Oh, that there there was something similar said, but it was kind of it shade. It was with some shade. Uh, we had a bill here called uh, SB seventeen in last year's session that would have allowed people with professional licenses to discriminate against LGBTQ plus people and not have any repercussions from their, uh, you know, I'd say from their professional licensing agencies. So there, there I said, so uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend Neil Cazares, uh, Thomas, who runs the Cathedral of Hope up in Dallas. It's the largest LGBT church in the country. 
um, was testifying, and he basically said to one of the folks who tried to claim that he was a Christian on this, he said, if your religion calls for you to demonize and legislate hatred against other you know against people you need a new religion and he wanted to debate and he wanted to start debating it and he said i'm the last person that you want to debate i have a doctorate in theology and speak fluent greek and aramaic and i was like Ooh. <laughs> I was like, hmm, this is getting interesting. <laughs> because they weren't used to seeing progressive pastors come up there to uh, you know to lobby. And they got an earful. They got an earful on their you know on their evil <laughs> in that session. And matter of fact, the bill actually died in the committee. When it got to the house, when it got to the Texas House, it, 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 we, we sent it to a committee. Said we, it, it ended up in a committee where it died. So, yeah, that that speaks to the shift that I would not, that I didn't see five years ago. Uh huh. Ago, I would not have believed at all that clergy in Texas would be in Texas clergy. You know, so Northeast Connecticut clergy. If you were telling me that they were leading the fight and winning stuff, duh, of course. But but hearing that out of Texas gives me a little bit of hope. Yeah, the final, the last straw was 2015. Uh, mm -hmm. Was uh, for uh, for the Houston area it was 2015 uh, when the hero repeal happened. No, wait. What's um, the gay group out there in Houston though that has so their question to join the group is, do you support Black Lives Matter? We don't. Is this a real thing, Monica? Yeah, it was. What? There's this there's this lesbian, the white lesbian in San Antonio, who's problematic as hell. Uh-huh. Um I say who's problematic as hell. And actually she's running the group out of San Antonio. So yeah, we're you say we've been clapping back on her behind and all the folks in San Antonio are trying to rein her in too. We're trying to rein her in right now, too, because we don't need it. You know, we're four months from an election right now. And we got a shot at flipping the Texas House. Flipping mm -hmm. the Texas House. And also, uh, we've got four women running for seats on the Texas Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So we got a shot that if we do this correctly, we can flip the we can flip control of the Supreme Court in two cycles. Yes. Because um, normally would, there would only be three justices who were up for election, but mm -hmm. because Trumpy Boy snatched one of them off the uh, off the Texas Supreme Court and put him in the Fifth Circuit. We had an extra, you know, so it's four. We have an opportunity to flip four seats this year. And they know it too, which is why, the, <laughs> which is, and, and they made some questionable rulings, including on, on, on mail in ballots that, you know, the mail in ballot one was a strictly partisan yeah. one and, and it was for, and it was political, and it was political survival in that too as to why they don't because they are definitely afraid that they are going to they're definitely afraid that they're going to lose the, the control of the as a of the uh texas supreme court uh in the last couple of years um we as a we we literally have flipped five of the ten texas court of appeal districts um, the judiciary, the entire judiciaries in Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, are Democratic. So as a, and in the last cycle, they lost twelve seats. They lost twelve. Republicans lost twelve seats on their majority. So they're, you know, so they're at John Cornyn to tell you how scared John Cornyn is. He's been begging for money from the Republican Senate Campaign Committee. 
because he's definitely afraid he's going to lose. And it's possible because oh, wow. Beto only, only missed knocking off uh, Ted Cruz by 120,000 votes. So you guys are purple now, like Texas. Is yeah, we are literally purple now. <laughs> because since 2009, the number of non-white Texans outnumbers white Texans population-wise. Basically, we're California. The only reason that we aren't, we aren't totally blue is because of the voter suppression and the gerrymandering. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and your gerrymandering is epic. They, so, they, no. they do us well, but yours is just like masterful. Yeah. So, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, we're focusing hard on getting that, uh, on, on getting control of the Texas House because it strengthens our hand in redistricting where we can at least get some kind of fair maps for the 2020s. Mm -hmm. And, and, Yeah, Carly says fair maps would be good. That'd be a great start. Yeah, it would be. That'd be a great start across the country because gerrymandering is killing a lot. It's what's killing a lot of us. This, this country is, they're, they're trying to sell it as a center-right country. The United States is not a center-right country. It never has been. And it never, and it never really has been. As far as those of us in Connecticut, like I said, my hope for this election cycle is to get every Republican out. I don't care if they're, they're on the mosquito abatement board. The, yeah. dirty, the dirtiness that they're doing in this state makes me not want to like any of them. Not a good You go after kids. You don't go after and kids. I've had the attitude for years that, like I told most of the Bernie folks, I said, you want a revolution? Here's your revolution. Fire every Republican out of office down the dog catcher. Yes. And then keep them out for the next 20 to 30 years. Yep. Keep them out of power for the next 20, 30 years. That way that we can, you know, we can pass all the progressive legislation we need, tweak it, whatever, you know, because they're in the minority. And also it drags, it forces them to drag left or die. Exactly. The problem is though, is our judicial system is now overrun with <laughs> the new conservative. Exactly. So that, that's going to be a new generational issue that even if we fight back at a legislative level, there's always going to be that check that that could always possibly be overturned in all, all the that I'm trying to do. Yeah, yeah, but that's where street that that's important. where street heat comes in. Yeah. Because look at um, what we managed to do on street heat. Street heat will defeat even the most reactionary judiciary. And our history has shown that. We have to be prepared to be in the streets and be in the suites. It's the only way you're going to win this. We need people like Monica, for example, in our state houses. In our state houses, toiling, fighting that good fight inside. We need to be at the ballot box as well, getting, it, getting as many reactionary people out. Yeah. But, 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 but as far as this judiciary, the answer is in the streets. Because we got in those streets, the Supreme Court said, oh, wait a minute, maybe it's not a good idea to try and pass this. Maybe we need we need to win we need to win this thing we need to we need to go the right way on this component. But, Not yeah, going to be perfect, of, but to start. Yeah, but one of the reasons I'm you know I'm still angry about the 2016 um, presidential is we were on the verge of flipping the Fifth Circuit progressive, and had we been able to put Hillary in, we would have flipped the Fifth Circuit progressive. But unfortunately, now they've been restocking it with, I mean, they've been restocking it with judges like it's going out of style. And young judges, young judges yeah. who are in their 20s and 30s, young judges who are, yeah. they're going to outlive us. They're yep. We have, to, yeah. we have to figure out how to, how to uh, protect the 10th Amendment. Do you understand what I'm saying? At that state level, if you want the, that's just what's talking about that check on the federal level, you have call, to figure yeah. out how to how to protect your tenth the, your state's tenth amendment so that your state look your state is in charge and and it's hard because you know I'm from the south so I get where 
sometimes you don't want the 10th amendment to come into play because you were hurt more in those states. Um, luckily, Texas has gone uh, purple, Florida's turned purple, Georgia is turning purple. So we're making the change and, it's, and it's, it has to be a grassroots state change. And it's very weird to see um, how we're doing that now on that level where we're losing these federal seats and, and the judiciary where you have to now protect the 10th Amendment and, and, and protect states' rights so that if we can continue to do what you're saying, vote Republicans out, get progressives in, do this, that, and the other, then we will have protection on those state levels. And once it gets to the federal, then it, it kind of changes the dynamic there because then they have to, they have to then um, write their opinions and, and, and based on still, they have to recognize the 10th Amendment. So I feel like the way that states are flipping, I think we are going in a very, uh, a good direction on flipping purple to blue. And we just have to keep going at that local level. And, and people have, of, of color and black people specifically have to recognize that those um, voting in your state elections, your local elections matter. Like you said, all the way down to the dog catcher matters. Because if you keep it within your state and you turn all of that blue that, that, or purple to blue, then the, the judiciary can only check you so much. Yeah. And we have to recognize that all the way up to the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court has to, has to turn it back to you because they can't violate the 10th Amendment. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, wanted to, to yeah. jump in on that one. To, yeah, to piggyback on your point about <laughs> flipping your state's purple to blue, yeah, the judiciary change I was talking about, when I say when the you say when the evangelicals are trying to push stuff now, they can't go they can't go to you know the let's say the court, courts at the county level or the you know the this or the court of appeals level because we flipped them. <laughs> so they literally had to go to the they go straight up to the Supreme Court Texas Supreme Court and file stuff now because it's nine. You know, because right now our state Supreme Court is 9-0 Republicans. And we got a chance to, to totally flip it in two cycles. Wow. Yeah. We have, you know, we have four women running for, you know, Texas Supreme Court. And if we if we are fortunate to get all four of them on, it takes that nine nothing down to five four. And then there are three more running in 2022. So that would give us, all we'd have to do is knock off one of the three, you know, assuming we do our job in, you know, some, in four months to flip the court. I'm greedy. I want it all. <laughs> well, and what y'all did in the courts in Houston is any indication that they wouldn't bet against them. Because I saw what happened down there. Oh, yeah. yeah. We went 59 and 0. We flipped 59 judicial benches down here. Yep. All the way up to the court of, you know, the court of appeals level, the state court of appeals level. And the thing that really irritated them, we replaced the, the I said Republican judges with women. With LGBTQ folks, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, we Insult we yeah injury. we diversified the benches. Y'all 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 know we had eighteen sisters that ran. They all won. Yes. Oh yeah. No, those oh, are yeah. 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 So, and they are amazing. They are amazing because I was I was let I was grinning from ear to ear when I was going to all their invest. I spent the first three months of 2019 going to all their investiture ceremonies, so it was fun. Nice. <laughs> oh, I saw that on I saw that on the blog. You was like yeah. you was you were showing those pictures every chance you got. Yeah, it was every yeah. single chance. Because it was it was nice to look at the directory and look. Oh, I know her. I know her. <laughs> Him. <laughs> it was nice to look at the directory and and know that you know so a fresh wind has blown out all the crap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Now the only now the only thing only thing that would be better is if the Texans won the Super Bowl. Yeah. Listen. Why you gotta bring sports into it? Uh, see that this is where I've got to practice my. <laughs> no, thank you. Let's turn that off. Let's end that right no, there. No, we, we gotta give them their space. It's important to them. <laughs> no, la, it's la, a, la, I la, so. la. Hey, hey, hey! Monica is a Houston sports fan. I'd love to see the Texans get a Super Bowl at some point because I know you, Houston has been has had it rough on the sports side for the last, on, with the exception say, of a couple years. Yeah, on, on the, the football side, side, they've had it for a minute. Boo, and how it, you feel about sports? You don't look like you care either. And as a Steelers fan, I feel bad because I was a part of that. So. <laughs> yeah, 1980. I still, yeah, I still curse Monica. about. I still Monica. curse about that play. Monica, uh -huh. Mike Mike Renfro was out of bounds. No, he was he, in yes, bounds. Yes, he was. <laughs> you only had one foot. Look at the foot. Yeah. He had one foot. Oh, he had two feet yeah. in back. He, he dragged the other one he in had back. One foot, no control. No. 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 What year were you born in? Because they're talking about a football game that happened in 1980. What year were you born in? 88. <laughs> <laughs> I was born 91. The first real argument we have tonight is about an out of bounds play. I love this face. <laughs> <laughs> I love my. Hey, hey. Mike Lempro was cool. I interviewed him years later, and he told me I had them both in. I had them both in. I had them yeah. both in. I, but half my family is from Beaumont, so so I know the pain. Oh, yeah. But I say, but I enjoy. I say I enjoy when the Cowboys lose, though. So because their fans are just arrogant. It's like the, let's say the re major reason I couldn't stand them because remember when they had Texas Stadium. We have a hole in the roof of our stadium so God can watch his favorite football team. They would literally say that. And I would, and would, and I would literally say that. And I would always answer, gee, the Steelers don't play in Texas Stadium. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my favorite I, one, back uh, when we, in 79, the Oilers played the, um, as they played them on Thanksgiving Day. And Earl Campbell ran over, around, through him for almost 200 yards. I was laughing. My cousin was talking crap before the game started. He couldn't. We couldn't find. I couldn't find him when the game was over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I get the misery. They kicked me out of Thanksgiving dinner that day. Oh. My whole house were Cowboys fans, and I can't stand Dallas. <laughs> No Steeler fan can stand Dallas. We can't stand them either because they're just arrogant. Agreed with that. The, the only fans that are worse are Patriots fans. That would be true. We live here. Agree with that. Amen. Mm -hmm. Patriots fans are the worst. I was going to dip it and say that. Yeah, they're the worst. I'm not from up here, so I'm not, you know, I'm not a Patriots fan, but I'll be damned. And they're Aww. deep about it. They just lost their quarterback. Come on now. Let, let, Here let's... we go. So, <laughs> so is everybody riding the Buccaneer bus now? What, where are they going? Because <laughs> you know, I, I would, I, I would love to see how the Patriots fans react this year if they're they going to be wearing that red, white, and blue well, this year. Or Cam Newton or is going to be their quarterback now. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be. But interesting. you saw that. You saw the pay disparity, right? You saw yeah. the two. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I heard it. about that. That's the only thing I know about any of this. That he's not getting paid anywhere near as much as he should be getting paid. As that Correct. Because no, they basically they want, you do realize Andrew, they didn't want black men to be quarterbacks for the longest time because they I said we weren't that. smart enough. We weren't smart enough, but amazingly, we're able to run balls, catch them, get you, you know, trophies. But it's the person who has to throw to one person or call one play. And all, all your job is to call a play and get it to one person and be able um, to see the field. And I'm, 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 I'm going to add on top of that, they also wouldn't allow black players to be middle linebackers because the middle the middle linebacker is basically a quarterback on the defense. They call yeah. you know they call the shifts and, and all that other stuff on defense. And it's amazing, but you want us everywhere else on the field. Yeah. Don't join the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> no, but. No, but Adrian, as a as a person who had played who has played that position, a little bit more to it than that. I know. I, <laughs> I, I'm a college athlete. 
I'm a college athlete, so I'm well aware. I and yeah. my my favorite position is my point guard. I'm well aware of uh-huh. what actually goes into that. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah. I'm also a center, and I I knew every play. I knew every position because as an athlete, you're supposed to know every position, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So for them to con- continue to say, well, yeah, you're not smart enough to run a position. Come on now. If you know college basketball, you know Don Staley is the best point guard there ever was. No, Sue Bird. Was, no. no. I will, I'll Here fight we go. you on that. Oh, Sue Bird. No. And I, and I guarantee Bird. you. I will I fight you on that. Sue Bird. I have the same number gold Sue medals. Bird. Mm-hmm. Goes back to they Don do. Staley. Let me I put it this way. Person, Sue, who would you? I'll, I'll just Bird, say this. But, Sue Bird, three Staley. rings as a quarterback. Don Staley. <laughs> Don Staley. Don Staley, NCAA title. No rings. Don There's none. Staley won on every level. What I'm saying is Don Staley, Sue Bird will go back if you ask Sue Bird who, her, who she took after in her favorite. Don Staley, because uh, Don, Don was Don. a Lenta team quarterback. But if I put them together step for step, and I love me some Don. Yeah. I love me. Oh, but don't worry. I'm, I'm I UConn love all the way since mm-hmm. I, and I'm a Florida girl. I've mm-hmm. always been UConn. Don't get me wrong. I grew up Rebecca and, and Nakisha. Don't get me wrong because Nakisha Sales is coaching at my alma mater. So uh-huh. I, I'm, I've been. UConn. But I'll tell you, if I had one game, like, I know those people too. Keep if up. I had to, if I had one game to play where the price of losing was my mortal soul in hell for an eternity, <laughs> and I need a point guard. <laughs> I'm taking Dawn. I'm, t- I'm playing. I'm taking Dawn. I'm taking Dawn. If yeah. I had one, I'm taking Dawn Staley circa 1991. I'm taking Dawn. Absolutely. As long Absolutely. as I can get Tammy Reese at the two guard. Easy. As long as or I Cynthia Cooper. Tammy. Or Cynthia Cooper. Cynthia Cooper. Okay, we hear you. We hear you. And you want, you want Tina Thompson on your team, too. Come on now. I do no, and I want I want Jeanette Darkane is the I want Jeanette hey, Darkane swinging. They want four. They want four consecutive championships. Come, come through, arena. come mm-hmm. through. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, we should have taken that over, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I will yeah. not. And I'm, hey. I only simplified the quarterback issue because it was yeah. like you can't continue to take that away from us because if yeah. you're an athlete, well, you're supposed to know every single position on that on that field, right? Well, and on that court. The interesting thing is now, because of the spread offenses and stuff they're using now, mm-hmm. uh, they they suit black athletes now because you know in terms of the the, the spread offense is well suited for our skill sets for the athletic athleticism, right? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Well, well, also athleticism combined with <laughs> with brain power, because mm-hmm. most importantly, being able to think as you move. Think and move. Think and move. Not and sit remember, back in the pocket. The, the original spread quarterback played in Houston for years. The original spread quarterback. Let's talk about Warren. Let's talk about Warren Moon for a minute. Yeah. Oh, we're talking about Ron. Let's, let's oh, talk yeah. about yeah. Oh no, Warren was doing see, people forget Warren was great in Houston, but he was ridiculous when he was in Edmonton. I remember seeing him up there. And oh yeah, when Canadian everybody, ball. Yeah, and everybody's looking at him going, What the hell are you doing in Canada? What the hell are you? Are because you he, know, he didn't get drafted know, out of Washington. Drafted, which was stupid. He didn't get drafted out of college. Mm-hmm. Which was the dumbest thing ever. Mm-hmm. And there mm-hmm. were a lot. It's like Tony Dungy was a quarterback. Tony Dungy was a quarterback. He ended up playing defensive. He ended up being moved to defensive back. Mm-hmm. I guess oh, he yeah. didn't pass. No, no, that no, <laughs> that's what. But that back then, that's what happened with a lot of black quarterbacks. One of the greatest, one Holy of the greatest, to, one yeah, one of the greatest to ever play at the college level came from my hometown. Walked in, walked into, walked into a to the Denver Broncos camp. Ended up starting, and still holds their record for most touchdown passes by a rookie. Still holds it. Mm. Still holds that. Marlon the Magician Briscoe. Look him up. Okay. Omaha boy. Exactly. Omaha boy. Here we go. Oh, we in, we in Nebraska. That's where I grew up. I'm on the saying, other and, and you're damn, mad, Carly. And, just and, you're, damn. and Monica, you're mad about you're mad about Houston, Pittsburgh, and the AFC Championship. I'm still mad about the '79 Cotton Bowl. Oh, <laughs> I'm, st- I'm still mad. I'm still mad. Oh, about that one? To the U- oh. I'm still mad about using to that losing to the Houston Beer offense. 
I'm still I'm still a little sore. About oh, it. that that offense was a work of was a work of art when it was running. Oh, no, Houston, running Houston, 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 Houston. Oh, Houston Cougars. Yes, back yes. In, back in that southwestern corruption. I mean, it's yeah. Not so <laughs> So, no. so, Jeff, remember this morning we were talking about how these conversations go and they go <laughs> they're supposed to go how they're supposed to go? Totally went sideways. <laughs> Wait, and that, no, it didn't. And I'm about to shut up again because, so, Kyler, one of the things, and like this is full circle because early on in the conversation, Kyler, Kyler was like, you know, if you want to talk about to me about being trans 24 7, I'm going to get out of the conversation because I cannot talk about this. Like, I've got other shit that I'm, yeah. so. This is the black trans conversation. And again, I'm gonna sit my ass out because if you've got social justice issues with these football players, I can jump in. If one of them beat his wife, I got yeah. in. Like I can <laughs> Oh yeah. But, but can well, I talk about the actual that. game that these people are doing? But, but Kamora, that goes listen. back to the campaign, right? Y'all, we did Kamora and I and um Mike Keo of I Am Not a Virus did a campaign this weekend yeah. and it was to humanize black bodies. And it was mm -hmm. a portrait series here. And it was to humanize Black bodies from every spectrum of the Black community, right? And yeah. there was no talk about uh, your sexuality or where you're from. If you were proud of it, no one stopped you from saying it. No one, nobody yeah. cared. It was about making sure Black voices were heard in their joy and in their sorrow. And that was our, that was the campaign that uh, Kamora and I just did together this weekend. And it was a beautiful yeah. campaign. Mm -hmm. She will attest to that. Um, and because um, I love being an angry, angry black dyke. I love it. And there's so much more that I bring to the table. Like if, if you give me space, we can, we can be full human beings. And that's what was the purpose is to provide that space so you could be full. And everyone walked out a little less a little, a li they weren't as heavy, right? You weren't as heavy when you walked out because you kept seeing these black black bodies walk in and out of this building that was just like, thank you. I got to get it off my chest. I got this shit off my People shoulder. People brought in their props, their own special props that, that said who they were. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, the, and like you said more, like being here and, and taking that moment, that five minutes to talk about sports, because we are humans and we have a love of things and you and you do not get to take that away from us in this community and people need to recognize that and stop stop pigeonholing us to certain things what's your favorite sure. movie all time yeah. black movie all time oh yeah. favorite black movie all time yeah <sighs> the spook who sat by the door imitation of life Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's one that I realized because that growing up, my father used best, to watch it. The best man is one of my favorites. Yeah. Oh yeah. The best man the is one of my favorites. The wood. Nineties black wood. films are the best. Period. <laughs> Not okay. I don't know about that. Well, Malcolm X. Malcolm. Spike should have gotten his Oscar for Malcolm X. Correct. And Denzel Absolutely. too. But you, you know what? Nineties films did they humanize us also? We 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 got to do yeah. rom coms. We got to do scary movies. We got to do serious flicks. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. It was the it was the the, the the that that was the beginning, and then we it was skipped a, the two thousands, and yeah. now we're back on it. Yeah. Yeah, I love. Uh, she's. I, 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 I still love School Days. School Days was good. Even, school even days though, was good. Yeah. <laughs> I still good love school. Hair, see if I care. Good and bad hair. I mean, like, awesome. I have the soundtrack. I will. I will. And I will write. Yeah. Get yeah. back before yeah. I kick your gamma ass. Yeah. I said <laughs> jump back before I kick your gamma ass. ass. <laughs> uh -huh. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. 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 Elijah was already on Facebook if you'd like to connect. I sent some of you uh, friend requests already. Awesome. Take care. Awesome. Yes. Cool. Yeah, something I'm thinking about it. Boomer. Love you. Boomer this has right been now. awesome. I, I love these workshops. Uh, I'll see you all soon. Uh, you uh, Elijah, Elijah, you are yeah. awesome. Inbox Thank me. You. Yeah. Thank you, Elijah. You're awesome. Bye. You guys are. Mm. I, I love having people like you in my life. Yeah. <laughs> <Not until. laughs>
<laughs> oh, take care. I'm sure yeah. she was. Love Bye. you. Come on, Boomerang had Eartha Kid. Oh, had... my oh. Ass. <laughs> oh, Boomerang, Boomerang, definitely. <laughs> Okay, it is 9.04. I'm turning the Facebook Live off. So beautiful Facebook people, do wonderful things. If you want to join us on Zoom, because these folks ain't trying to shut up. So so I'm not closing. <laughs> All right. Facebook no. Live, I'm, clo I'm turning you off. We can keep talking here. Adrian, so you got you to gotta coordinate. You got to coordinate. Not, <laughs> not me. You got to coordinate. <laughs> I'm not gay. I say, my uh, brother is gay. He is gay. Hey, he is gay. <laughs> Boomerang. Blake McNone and the scripts, like, you know, <laughs> oh, you yeah. got Tommy Davis, you got people, Smith, you got people in the restaurant. Like, you got everything in there. Yeah. We're strong. Oh, for real, out. Natasha? She for was real? No, you need to tell that story. Yeah. No, you got to unmute. Natasha? You got to unmute and tell that Arthur, story. No. She's the queen. No, nope, you got to tell the story. No, you got to unmute that. We had, uh, when we moved to Warehouse Cafe to the Warehouse 2 over on West Service Road, um, we had a series of a lot of disco performers in there that I brought in, including the Weather Girls, Eartha Kitt, Grace Jones. And it was just an amazing time period there. And Eartha yeah, you got a Grace Jones amazing, story too, don't you? Woman. Um, Grace Jones was another strange woman, but she was really great. She appeared for us twice. The first time she appeared, she rode up onto the stage on a motorcycle, right at the ramp onto the stage. The second time she came in, she was in one of those Egyptian litters, and she had two black men in front and two black women in back, and they carried her up on the stage while she lay a leopard on a leash in with her. And she did two 45-minute shows, and she was just, wow. That was a, was that a studio? Studio 54? It was a, it was a uh, gay club in Hartford. It started out as a warehouse, and then oh, moved okay. over to West Coast Road as a warehouse, too. It was one of the longest okay. running uh, gay bars in Hartford. Yeah. It was an amazing place to work at. Yeah, we somehow lucked out and had like all of these strange, amazing gay performances. Wow. It's like the gay chitlin circuit. Oh yeah. And, and you got mm -hmm. folks who just would just come through like, oh really? Yeah. Yep. Like I what remember a great like, completely not, not wanting to fuck around with the drag queen. So RuPaul was the I don't know, the MC or whatever, and completely ignoring Dr RuPaul because there's some black lesbian with a guitar. And I was like, oh, I need to go get her autograph. I need to go talk to her. And then a couple of years later, RuPaul turned into like, that was when the first song, the, um, no, back to my roots. Cause like, what, what was the, what uh, was the first? Supermodel. Supermodel, uh, yeah. Because, yeah. yeah work. work it, girl. Yeah, yeah. Cause, cause that was a song. That was a song that was being sung all over. And like, like there was like four different mixes of one song. It's like, whatever, I don't need to hear this drag queen sing. There's a lesbian with a guitar over there. Yeah. 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 We, now, we've all been there, right? Now, was the lesbian. Well, we can't get the lesbians with the guitar to come up to our state, though. And that, they don't do know, shit. Britney, Britney James, Doria, we can't get them to go past New York. And I'm like, we're up here, too. We yeah. love you. Yeah. All right, take so care. No, no nice you, can get, you, all. you can get the white lesbian. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Yeah. 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 Doria yeah. Worked, uh, Roberts, there's that rock and roll camp for girls up in Western Mass, and they, with like a whole bunch of the like lesbian powerhouse singer folks showing up. I don't but think they skip over us. Because oh, they, they do. We, yeah, you got to go drive up to scary places. They think we're just going to go to Boston or, or New York. No and I'm like, no, the, stop. The sad part, to get to Western Mass, you got to fly in the, so you got to fly in the in BDL. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to fly right. in Bradley. Yeah. To get to Western Mass in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's where they are. They don't want to hang out with us down here. They want to hang out with us up. Yeah, North, Northampton. <laughs> no ho. Been there. Been mm. there. <laughs> Back in uh, 2008, we had a uh, we had a trans pride march. And I was the grand marshal for it. So, so it was like a who's who. Let's say Lewis. I, I actually stayed with Lewis. I stayed <laughs> with Lewis and, uh, I said, and Chrissia. During, yep. during my visit up there and on the way back to the airport he dropped me off at the basketball we, we drove through Springfield and they dropped me off at the basketball hall of fame for an hour yep mm-hmm so, but 
It wasn't the first time I was up there. I said, I've been there twice. So. Mm -hmm. But. We'll get you out here again. Like, like the KCC, once this is amazing, once we can start mm -hmm. around again, we'll be getting you. I told you, I told you that before and COVID came yeah. in. But I am going to get you out here so that people can experience you the ways that they should. We need you. We absolutely need you. And, and you're, you're full of education and you're right in that, that policymaking legislature. You have that voice. You have that huge voice that people need to know about. I agree, Kimora. And I'm, I've only been on this damn phone call for... But Kimora, Kimora and I have been friends for, what are we going to say, three weeks okay. now? Yeah. It feels yeah. like... And it's but but like, I got the phone call. No, but I got the phone call from a friend who I've known since we were children. And I got sure. the phone so, and Gino isn't going to waste my time. So when he said, I've got this person you need to know, you're going to love her. He wouldn't have wasted my time with that. He wouldn't have. And so I was like, okay, let me meet this woman. And then I fell in love with you because he's Gino. Correct. Yeah. Ditto. Ditto. So we, we yeah, need your voice up here. And you, you have um, kids, you have plenty of people up here who need your voice. You know, um, I didn't say it when, when the, the Facebook live was on, but my yeah. niece is trans and she's 10. And she's all over. She's all over the newspaper now, right, Kamora? She's <laughs> she's out there now. If you got no, 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 no. This this was beautiful. So we had our big queer rally, right? And so we ended it with, with a big yeah. vogue off, and it was fun. So so everything happened. And this little girl is standing off on the side, just watching and enjoying it and watching. And so Ephraim Ephraim Adams, the DJ, like he gets out and he shows everyone, you know, this is how we're gonna do. We're gonna do runway. So he goes through a few things, and then she steps out. And she stepped into her truth. Like, like how, do you, how do you explain it? Like, she stepped into her truth. She had attitude. She had swag. She had just, it was her. Just her. Um, and when we were talking about, plaza. It was a plaza. Wow. And when yeah. Kyler was talking about being in, in these uh, cis spaces and people yeah. talking about things, she she's already been on Broadway in Hartford. She's already she's already been in those uh, those spaces that that no one knows that she's she's yeah. there and she's already she's already making a name for herself at, at in Broadway. And getting in the newspaper for being exactly. that beautiful girl who owns herself. Exactly. So but she's she's already do. out there and people don't even they don't even know and, and it's a beautiful experience because she knew she's known her entire life. She came about um, you know, into her truth at about age six and said it out loud. Um, thank God I have to say, thank God that she was already in an LGBTQI family to be able, to, but her mother's great who isn't an LGBTQI, but it, the, we, we had the safe space for her to be herself. And um, yeah. it's been an amazing journey because not everyone gets this journey, right? So we, yeah. have, mm -hmm. we have to make this, this journey safe for our children because when we do that, then we've done something. We've yeah, done cause, something. Because, yeah, Adrian, you know, the, the back, piggyback on your point, we still have idiots that are attacking Isaiah Wade right now. Tell him. Yes. See, that, yes. that's something black folk need. Black folk okay. need to see that. Never mind. They need that that family that. is covering that child beautifully, and the community yeah. is still trashing them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And still trashing them. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I have a, we, there's a blog post that I wrote where I wrote an open letter to Zaya when she first came out. When she first came out, because it was just something that was on my heart, and I just wanted to, you know, let Zaya know is okay. You know, the, the the bullet points on from that letter is like, okay, you have a history. You have a proud history. You have el you, know, you have trans elders uh, say who are do who are doing whatever it takes to make sure that by the time that you're our age, the world will be in a better a better place for you than it was when we encountered it. I'm looking right at it right now. Uh -huh. I, I'm just you know I I just am in so in awe and in, and I have so much respect for everything. Um, that you were doing for for our community and, and, and for the trans community because it's so needed. It's yeah. so needed what you guys are doing because I like Kamora said earlier, you know, um, I would be considered a, a cisgender a lesbian woman, but 
I'm trying my best to protect my trans niece in these spaces. And I, and I, I, she, she's looking to me as a woman, right? But I don't know every single bit of her struggle. And I'm trying to be with her in that moment, but she needs there's, to see. So I, I, still, point, I, I say there's still stuff that, that she's going to need to, she's, there's still stuff she's going to need to know uh, yeah, and, about and, how to navigate the world in a black female body. Absolutely. Um, you know, some of the stuff she's going to find out on her own. But, mm -hmm. you know, as long as yes, you can, yes, I, because some of the stuff that I deal with is pretty much the same crap that, you know, cis black women deal with. Mm -hmm, Having mm -hmm. our intelligence discounted. Having, yeah, so I can, give her, I can give her the cis black woman side, right? But there's other mm -hmm. things that she's going to have to deal with that I can't carry her through. I can, yeah. I can uphold her, but I can't carry her through, right? Yeah. And, and just to see, you should see her light up when I, said, when I say, that girl's just like you. Mm -hmm. when I point to another trans woman of mm -hmm. color and she just lights up and it's like, there's this, this relief, this, this shedding of, yeah. of something that happens to her. And it, and, because and it, every one of us, because every one of us at one time or another thought that we were the only one, mm -hmm. you know, thought we were the only one. And then we find out, Oh, okay. Or, or because the narrative around trans folks has been revolving around white trans women for so long uh, that, you know, it was one of the reasons I started the blog in 06, because uh, I was tired. I was tired of that narrative because I knew that we had elders. We had trans <laughs> elders. I knew we had elders who had done some amazing stuff. And out of curiosity one day when um, Johnson Publishing Company cut a deal with Google, uh, with Google Books to digitize the Jet Ebony and Jet archives, mm -hmm. out of curiosity, I just typed the word transsexual in to see what would pop up. And I was amazed at articles coming from 1950s. Oh, yeah. Wow. And in some cases, wow. and in some cases, they they respectfully covered the folks in question. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Jet, Jet really. Mm -hmm. There's a that, lot yeah, of they, 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 they didn't they didn't misgender folks. Mm -hmm. I said in some of these articles. Wow. I said, as it, no. And this was years before the AP style book mandate. Mm -hmm. I was gifted a whole bunch of old jets that I mm -hmm. used to talk about how, how transphobia and homophobia was given to us because mm -hmm. we knew that we were supposed to hate our, our queer folks. We didn't, and, and we were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Little Richard was... Well, the disclosure... I mean, we learned from our indigenous folks, right? Who have never, yeah. who historically have, have never... Seen the have y'all seen Disclosure on Netflix yet? Seen what? Disclosure. The disclosure. disclosure documentary. Yeah. Excellent, di excellent, excellent documentary. Excellent. What's that it basically, it basically, it basically is the, Laverne Cox produced it. It basically talks about the history of all the uh, transgender tropes that you see uh, in, in film and television. Uh huh. We're um, that when we're done with this, yeah, me and you, me and you both, you already know it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you got the big, you got the big screen in the backyard. We want to watch. You know, that. we can put that on. <laughs> no, but, it's worth. Yeah, it is it's worth. Yeah, but it's it amazing. is worth it. Yes. It's worth it. Cause uh, there, cause now I've written a lot about some of those different, you know, some of the stuff that they covered and some people they covered, but even. It threw me as a. It, it even introduced me to some folks I didn't know about. There's an actress named Sandra Caldwell, who who basically been doing a lot of work up in Canada mm -hmm. because she, you know, because she was non-disclosed. She just came. Yeah, you know, she basically came out as trans. Not let's say probably about a year ago. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, she yeah, she's in this documentary. You know, you know, we walk around and, and we have 
these passing folks and and you know i want i want these voices to be heard i want these faces to be seen i want the queer community i want the trans community i want them to be seen in their full glory and that's mm -hmm. that's a goal of mine that is a goal of mine um yeah. Carly, you live up here yes i do i, I wish you would have come to the campaign this weekend we're gonna hold oh, wait, we're gonna wait. The two of you what? can go like work out your bodies and your muscles together. You both enjoy that shit. Here we go. You're right. You're right. Like, but I wish you would have been there because the, um, I want every piece of this black uh, this black experience to be seen um, because it's beautiful. Every piece of us, every every body is is yeah. beautiful, and every story has its own um, its own path. And I just you I'll know, well, you ever do it again? Count me in on it. Thank you. Yeah, Thank right you. Now, you. Right now, I'm working on a personal project as well. I'm working. On, I'm working on a documentary on my life and my journey. Oh, next, year, cool. I turn, next year I turn fifty. So wow. I'm like, next year I turn fifty. So I figure, with all the change that's happened in my life, especially the last five years, it's time for me to chronicle this, and it's just time for me to just tell it. You know, yeah. just tell it all. Just tell mm -hmm. it. Yes, I turned 60 in 2022. Uh, Small pieces, does that have to be dicey. Wait, what is, is 60 Jubilee? Is that what a Jubilee is? What's the Jubilee? Not sure. Uh, I had to look it up, but. Uh, 60's got some name. Yeah, but that's, yeah, my 60th like birthday. The Jubilee was like 80. Mm -hmm. what, what did the queen just turn? Of England, 135. What you just turned? <laughs> He's a, Queen Elizabeth is like her 90s. We're not She's talking about 90s. Victoria. <laughs> Wasn't her Jubilee just at 90? I think Jubilee is like 90. Um, there's several Jubilees. There's actually Silver Jubilee, Golden Jubilee, Ooh. and Diamond Jubilee. Yeah. And she just 90 was a Diamond Jubilee. No, yeah. Di Diamond 75. Yeah. Yeah. Diamond 75. Yeah. Gold okay, is 50. <laughs> yeah, I know 50 is gold, but, but I'm dead serious that we, like, right now, sitting here with Monica Roberts, and, who is telling us that you're turning 60. And a question that I had for you earlier <laughs> that I didn't get to ask was you started, so you started Transcrio in 2006. Were you prepared for all of us to jump on your blog and need you? Were you prepared? Because I know that, like, in 2007, I was talking to people about this blog, and guess what? We all knew it, and we were all reading it. Well, it, it took off. It was, actually, I started the blog, for, let's say, one, because I was tired of, you know, most of the, the blogs at the time not basically, you know, it was, they were basically focused on, you know, say, on our white counterparts. And, and there, there wasn't really a whole lot of content, makeup tips, you name it, that was geared toward us. And, and I was also, I was already writing a column. I was already writing a monthly column in an LGBTQ paper. Mm -hmm. And so I saw the blogging, but it was a monthly. So I saw the blogging as a real time way to comment on the issues and stuff that were happening in the community. The blog just became more important than the column, and I eventually lost the column because uh, some, I say somebody got mad. I said, "Well, one of the bar owners got mad because I was calling out the uh, Shirley Q. Liquor <laughs> and, so thre and threatened the and threatened the owner of the paper and threatened so, the owner of the wait. paper." So Natasha and Vu, when I say that this was a nationwide effort and that there was like. Black lesbians, black, we were all over the country doing oh, this yeah. show. I mean, we were all, it was a concerted effort to, I just happened to be linchpin here in Connecticut, but we were all going to destroy this person's career. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, jazz, yeah, let's say, we tag team. team. And, and since I was at, the, and I was at the uh, epicenter where she lived in Kentucky. Yep. So I was constantly on that ass. <laughs> <laughs> Never understood why RuPaul managed her for so many years. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I don't like RuPaul's behind. I don't either. So damn much, yeah. So damn much complicated. I will, 
I will defend a whole lot of love of RuPaul in that, let me tell you who RuPaul was for people when people needed RuPaul. And that's as far as it goes outside of that. RuPaul has been problematic since 2002. Yeah. Very transphobic. But, but going back to like the early nineties in Wigstock, again, I was, oh. I was with the gay boys who had to go run up and like RuPaul was it. And, and knowing what that human being did for those people at that time, yeah. they, but god damn fuck it rule really and also you know and also have you know having you know having a show on network television at the time yeah. that celebrates all the wrong shit in all the wrong ways yeah, yeah. So, bob, bob, it was cool that they had bob the drag queen on i'm glad they gave bob the platform but but you know but getting back to it it's the blog became more important and especially after i lost the column and 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 I can tell you how important. I actually had somebody come up to me and tell me that blog posts that I wrote dissuaded them from committing suicide. I've had at least five people tell me that. That's five that I know of. Wow. That said that you know they had every intention of committing suicide that particular day. They started, you know. And for some reason, they grab, They went to the blog, start reading one post, then another, another. The next thing you know, four or five hours had passed. Yep. And it's at least five people have told me that reading posts on that blog has actually saved lots. So I've actually saved at least five that I know of because of that blog have, resistance. I have printed, I was going to say that I've given your blog to people, but let me tell you, like, I have printed out, like, I've had kids who are in locked residential facilities with no way to get shit. So mm. I've cut and pasted and printed you out and given you to kids. And, and you, so Monica years, years ago wrote a letter to a young person I was working with who was locked up. So CJTS is baby boy jail here in Connecticut. Mm. I was working with someone who's going through some shit. And Monica wrote this kid a real letter that there's no other place they were going to get this information. And they weren't going to get it given to them this way. And that, that really made a huge difference in this person's life. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I've had um, college professors use it. I've had several college professors tell me they use blog posts in their women and gender studies classes. And I've had people and I've had people at the high school level using that blog. So yep. Because you know, one of the decisions I made early, which was prop, which was the correct one, I refused to dumb down to an eighth grade level. You know, you know, because you know how most me people in journalism they tell you to write for eighth grade level. Yep. I said my readers are smart enough to understand these concepts. I'm not dumbing it down. And you know, but and it was it turned out to be the right call. On that, because yeah. there's some there's some of these concepts when we're talking about sex versus gender and you know, say and intersex issues and the, they say androgen insensitivity syndrome and you know, and all, I say I can't write that at an eighth grade level. Call the word the word. Yeah, exactly. That's what, and you know what, you're about to be up here in Connecticut cur curriculum and here in a minute once we get done with it. Don't, oh, don't, she, and don't doubt that because when I say something's going to happen, I go full in and, and Kimora and Kimora is, is already in. So I know, I know who, who to put in, in, in my, um, particular, uh, offense to get it done. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're about to be up here in Connecticut curriculum because it's needed. It's needed for the kids that we're talking about, um, uh, in our athletics, uh, mm -hmm. situation and, yeah, I say yeah, because I've been I've been I say irritated about what's been going on with Andrea, yeah, and what's it with them attack and then trying and basically trying to use they're trying to use this case. Oh yeah, because if it falls to, the wrong way, then every other state's gonna go after it and use it. Every conservative state, and, and we're not even a conservative state, right? And well, they're gonna not go only after that. It and they're gonna, they're going to go out, they will, they will hold on tight to this case if it doesn't go in the direction that we need it to go in. They will hold on tight and rock this thing all the way to the Supreme Court and then they'll start 
but the NCAA has already established policy on this, right? And the International Olympic Committee. Correct. Basically, yes. You have all these, these administrative <laughs> issues, regulations have already established policy on this. So you, you, and, why? And Connecticut's had state statutes, like I sent you the state statutes, right, Adrian? Like, we are set. There's absolutely no reason for this shit to be Yeah. Most, and yeah, and this most is states, the first time a yeah. trans individual has been playing a sport in the state of Connecticut. And that's, no. that's the, come on. These kids no. have been because, playing sports. Just because a trans individual may not be out does not mean that the trans in, this is the first time a trans individual has been no, playing no, sports. No, no, they've been out because I've had to waste my time. You hear I am about sports. I've had but to do waste you know what I'm saying? They, they fans watching because, trans you know, kids who are trans kids play their sports. It, it's the same, it's the same they were with anything. Just because you don't think you know someone who's gay doesn't mean we're sitting around here because we're here since the beginning of time. We're not, we're not new. No, no one places here. We're not, we're, no one made us up. This this is life. This is history. Yeah. And you need to go back uh, and you really yes, need but to- Yes, but they've decided that they're going to weaponize these girls though, because trans- athletes have been competing in Connecticut for years. It's been happening. It hasn't been underground. They've been doing it. And they decided that like right now they're going to make these girls these. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah, because they're black. Yeah, because they're black girls. Time with who's in the administration yep. and how the courts are, are going and people feel ballsy about things. Like this is a perfect time to make them their scapegoat. But, 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 it, but here's the interesting thing. The argument that they're trying to make saying that a trans feminine athlete, it isn't fair to compete against a trans feminine athlete. Well, um, it's an insulting argument that I as a trans woman could automatically beat any female athlete. That's bullshit. It is insulting because to all I, women. Yeah. I have played, I'm a tennis player. I've been playing tennis since high school. I was on varsity. There's no way in hell I could walk onto a tennis court and play Serena Williams. Correct. Yep. But and that, okay. and that's what Serena what Williams allow. would beat and, me and in strength no set. argument because yeah. they allow they allow females to wrestle with uh, males. They have well, no arguments because they allow, when you start, when you are allowing things to happen on, um, in binary gender roles, you, uh -huh. and then all of a sudden you, someone's non-binary or trans or whatever, and then all of a sudden you go, well, stop that. They, well, you've already wrecked that argument. You've already yeah. wrecked that argument. And here's the other thing. Uh, when you go, when I, when I, when I say, when I, I say when a trans feminine person goes on hormones, we lose whatever residual male strength level we had within a year. Yep. <laughs> within a year. In some cases, it's even faster than that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Big, but I big. talk to people and I talk, I go, you know that this all comes down. So you're talking about when you have the ability to be on um, any type of hormone for you to lose that uh, male mm -hmm. trait, let's say. Mm -hmm. But that what they will do is they will end up harming our children who do not have the ability or means to be on that that hormone, and then you and you've now othered them even more. And if yeah. it comes down to economics, when it comes to yeah. the younger children and family dynamics and everything else, luckily they have a family who's accepting them for who they are and their truth. Yeah. And, and maybe they did start their hormones early enough, you know, and we plan to do that with my niece. But that, that's not always the thing, right? So you, no, but it's you're not still, because the they don't get they don't get to start their hormone therapy to make them to fit into the box you want them to fit in as a more feminine trans individual. So then you still get, so then you still place them on the outside when what they're needing is affirmation to be a part of a community as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. And sports, you know, and it, as you know, sports does that. Uh, Absolutely. Sport, you know, it's not only good for, you know, mentally and physically, you know, but physically as well. Um, Absolutely. 
Yeah, and so, definitely, like, definitely for trans teens. So, okay, so right now I don't have kids, but it's summertime, and every year making sure that the trans teens got in the water, got into whatever kind of a bathing suit, whatever we were going to do, but mm -hmm. making sure they were able to experience their bodies in sports, yeah. and dance, and it's so important that we can experience our bodies and that our gender. We are humans. We need and, to socialize and do. And human these things. kids, their bodies, their bodies that are weaponized against them, like their bodies are being weaponized against them by every turn. And my and my shit, like my big shit around the sports thing, because one of the arguments yeah. that I'm using is about scholarships. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this isn't fair because they're beating other girls out of scholarships for college. At which point, can we just discuss? how horrible it is that college costs so much that we have our kids who, whether they like sports or not, whether they like orchestra or not, whether they like these extracurriculars, they've got to do them to get money for college. And if we've got kids who are this much competition for money to go to college, then that's the issue. The issue isn't who's competing and how- I was a college coach. Kamora, I was a college division one basketball coach. I'm looking at the best kid out there. And we know, and, and, but we're looking at the whole athlete, right? So if you're not good enough, if, if say the, the, the girls who are suing right now, say they're coming in second and third place, this is not interrupting their, their, their pathway to college because we're all well aware if you're going to make it on our level or not. It, it, so that argument to me is just so bogus because and they like, undercut their own argument because she beat one of the pointers beat andrea at the connecticut state uh, championships exactly year. so you, you, yes. can't, you can't keep saying they keep beating us you keep beating us but you just beat her so if you beat her then you know that it, uh, it's possible. So what they want to do at the end of the day, what's going to happen is they're going to change the dynamic of sports. Am I against it? Not necessarily. And I, I'm a. Uh, I'm what, they're I'm a what they're trying to do is kill titles. What they're trying to do is kill Title Nine. Yeah, but they, but they, they hope and pray they will. But they, however, they, however, the the case that just upheld that discrimination in uh, against LGBTQ folks. Uh, is a violation uh, is covered under uh, Title Seven. That yes. is going to impact this case. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. you know we have because to, the precedent has so, been set. Yeah. So once the precedent is set, so that's what. So when I was talking about your Tenth Amendment earlier that we're dealing yeah. with, then you want your judiciary. You want to know what precedent is set. So you take that along with you and you have to be mm -hmm. educated in those things to, to know what's going on. You have to educate our community mm -hmm. so that yeah. they know how to argue. So they don't, you don't want to get into a bullshit, a, a mud fighting argument. You yeah. need to say, well, did you know? Yeah. And put it on people in a completely different way saying, I know. It's the same thing we're trying to do with our black community. I yeah. know my rights. I know where the court lies. And once you well, give them that power, then, it, it, then no one can fight them because- Yeah, what, what I started doing was dropping uh, the link to trans athlete, which has a lot of the policies of the various uh, international uh, sporting uh, organizations, including mm -hmm. the IOC, uh, the IAF, and some of the you know, even down to roller derby. Yeah, and yeah. also yeah. has and many of the state, many of the state high school federations follow NCAA rules. Correct. For, you know, for obvious. Correct, and, because they have they have to because these, yeah. because they want athletes to go to college. So you got to follow the rules for them to get into those colleges on scholarship. You mm -hmm. you got to follow the the next the higher up, and 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 it, and it saves your ass right at the end of the day yeah. if you're just going ahead and following who, and NCA follows the IOC rules and this and that and the other. You yeah. know, I didn't go. I, I am a lawyer. Um, I did not go into administrative law because administrative law um, put me to sleep, but I do understand exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. What do you say, Kamora? I'm just laughing. All love. It put, 
it, it just it put me asleep. I was like, Lord, there's too many rules and regulations in this. They, the courts have an issue. Go to a, go to administrative issues. Go to the FAA. Go to the E. You know any of them, and you you're gonna be bogged down with red tape. And that and that's the NCAA. That's these these high school um, um, the administrative things. Yeah. You, you you you're gonna be caught up in that red tape for a long time and, and before it ever hits the court so now when we hit the courts you know the courts are gonna go well this is what you've already this is the precedent and these are the rules that have already been set and we're we can't and, I'm t that's it. and they will probably bring up the fact that you, you claim that you couldn't beat her but you you mm -hmm. are the connecticut state champion and then, she, and then it's done it's done for her at that point because that if that's your main argument and then you've already proven your argument wrong then the court goes well you, it's a moot point you have nothing to, to argue here you have no standing at this point mm -hmm. because you've done it that means someone else can do it that means the next person can do it so leave it leave it alone Leave it alone. Well, and I, I also brought up Adrian the point that you know because the, you know they were harping about last year's uh, Connecticut State Track Championship. I said, yeah, y'all talked about the the races that Andrea and the other girl won, but y'all also didn't bring up the fact that they finished fifth and sixth place in two others. <laughs> yeah. So it, it just adds on, right? And you just sit yeah. there going, let it go. Let no. it go because what, what yes, you're yes. making the fool. But what is this doing to them? And like, like, th and this is why we're all necessary because you guys are right there. And in my mind, I'm like, these poor girls. Like, like in my mind, I am one of those girls in her bed at night. Like, why, you know? Like now, everyone knows everything about me. Every time I go outside, and I'm not even that good. And I wish, I, like, I can just only imagine how this is affecting them. You've just outed a child. You've just brought more trauma to their life that they were trying. They just, most children, can they're simple, being judged just want to be normal, right? Yeah. They want to run a track. They want to be amongst their counterparts. They want to, they'll be even just take the like the other role. teens in the high school. Yeah. They want to be normal. And here um, we are. They want to complain about here. wearing masks. That's what they should be complaining about. Correct. And they have to worry about their safety. Their parents have to worry about their children's lives. That not that they weren't already worried about them, but they, it, it, now, and now it's a national thing. So then other parents yeah. see that and go, oh God, I can't, let's go to my aunt. I can't let her play any sports or she's going to have to, you know, do this and that. So we're going to st definitely stick with the arts when she's capable of playing any sport she wants to play because she's just naturally talented at sports. So mm -hmm. it's just, Either you, let me tell you, if you're an athlete, either you have it or you don't. Yep. Yeah. There, there ain't no, you could, you had, every, all of us had the teammates that you, you, you cheered for and you were like, God, I wish you were good because you have the heart, right? We all had the heart. <laughs> yeah. You wanted them to succeed. But as an athlete, either you have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And for people to be going after these children because they have something or they're good enough to, to, to proceed as state finals or whatever they're doing, you're just, you're just causing them more trauma. You're causing oh, yeah. the community more trauma. You're causing other kids not to be able to come out now. Yeah. yeah. So now we have to protect these babies who have to wait until they're out of, the, uh, out of these areas and, and these communities to come out when they should have felt safe. Yeah, they should have been able to be out in their communities, out to their classmates, and known that that was what like Correct. not have to believe that they're going to be on the national stage. Correct. Sweet. And I'm talking too much. I started drinking Jameson, so I'm talking too much. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Yeah. Now, because uh, also you remember the uh, the sister that um, that won that the, I say that won that. NCAA championship in track. And then when it tested her for her testosterone level. It was still within limits. Within it the was, limits it, of it testosterone. Was, so <laughs> it was actually it was actually below. It was actually below the, the requirement. So stop stop worry. Stop policing our bodies because you're That's the best, right? Yeah. Good. We got these levels. We got these levels. Yeah, stay within the levels. And it was below. It was actually yeah, below. Stop placing our bodies 
either you want us to be your 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 um athletes or you don't and they don't want they don't want it they 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 we're we're just a slave we're a slave to something else and we can't we can't even find our liberation within things that we excel at and and that is what when i was in college the first thing i told freshmen who came in i said get your degree I said, stop letting them use you for your body because they'll tear you apart and don't care where you go afterwards. They don't care if you work at Walmart, McDonald's or whatever. They'll, it doesn't matter what you're- They will prefer you work at Walmart and McDonald's. Yeah. They don't yeah. care. They'll say, poor you that you got there. I wish I, I wish I could help you while they get their cars paid for because I've been in both worlds. While they get their cars paid for and their houses paid for and everything else paid for and don't pay a damn dime for anything when they go in the community and then they go, don't you wish poor Kashana would have done better with her degree? I don't know why she, she couldn't do it because you didn't recognize her internalized trauma as being a gay black athlete, non-binary athlete at the time to put her into safe spaces so that she could flourish after she left this, this institution. That's why. Natasha, do you remember the Yukon girls who used to come to the warehouse? Oh yeah. Girls weren't, they weren't supposed to be gay, but they were all gay and they were all up in there. Oh we, yeah. Oh, but they weren't oh. Supposed in there. Oh yeah, that, that's a, that, that, that didn't shock me. No, that was, that was always that just straight up bullshit. Like, like you watched them and, you, and, and I just assumed like, dude, you, y'all are all girl basketball players. Of course you're gay. They were in the gay bar, but just couldn't be gay. And they couldn't no. like, yeah, they can make out it was worse in the gay bar, they can make out in the bathroom. Yeah, and and um, because uh, I I see that Carly's super familiar with it, athletics. It was way worse in the South. If you went oh, yeah. to University of Tennessee, or if Baylor. you go back and you look at University of Tennessee and Baylor athletes, and you look at the weave, that long weave in their hair, and their nails done. Yep. And you knew, and their coach, not the Baylor coach. But you knew that Pat Summit, God rest her soul, was in the closet. Because when you, I mean, I still have coaches in the closet. And I'm going, why? You don't yeah. have to be in that way. Gino but used it, to hate, so they used to hate it when we would come around. Like when, when we would be there to, to see the girls, they used to hate They don't us. want you like, anywhere near them. Nope. No. God, no. I mean, oh, yeah. before me and my wife, got, I, I married my groupie. <laughs> but before yeah. me and my wife got together, um, my team I was with my teammate, and she was full Oklahoma closeted. I mean, to the, we broke up every two months because God didn't want us to be together closeted, right? And that, uh, that's a struggle within itself. Uh, I'm 19, yeah. I'm going, all right, we're going to break up today. I'll, I'll catch you. I'll catch you in a day or two when you need some, and you're in my teammate or roommates, you know, and she wanted nothing to do with it but i had this little fan club of these little white professional lesbians and i loved every minute of it because i had already been out i'd been out my whole life so for me it was no issue i was just like yeah how you doing what's up one of the people used to come to this um to the warehouse i ran into her years later after she left the team in the college at a uconn basketball game that we brought yeah. all the uh, youth to. We got free tickets to bring the youth at the Civic Center. And during halftime, I went, up, went into the bathroom and she was standing in front of me in the line for the women's room. And she turned around, she kind of smiled, and she goes, aren't you the manager at the uh, Harper Gay Lesbian Love Office Center? I'm like, yes, I am. She goes, wow, this is in very short terms. So I remember you from the warehouse also. And then a very loud, screaming voice, did you used to be a man? Wow. And I was just like, wow. And I just walked out because I didn't know what to say. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. We, yeah. Because sometimes we'd have, you know, we'd have to watch out. You say, sometimes some of our, our oppressors are in our own community. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's the argument I'm having with some of our SeaTac people is they don't think drag queens and cross dressers belong in the trans umbrella. 
if it weren't for cross dresses, we wouldn't have had Southern Comfort and some of the other conventions we had back in the in, our, in the nineties. They need Thank to go you. back and check their history. Yes. Exactly. Or, or excuse me, let me tell them the history. Yes. There you go. That's huge. The largest, think, yeah. I Southern Conference started to... out. Yeah, Southern Conference started out as a cross dressers weekend. Yep. So, and before that, we had a conference here in in Texas uh, that was in San Antonio from 1988 to about 2000, called the Texas Tea Party. <laughs> you know, tea for trans. So, uh, but. Within the first, it's it started out as a cross dresser weekend, and within three years, it was one of the largest conventions in uh, largest trans uh, themed conventions in the country. And it's interesting, Natasha, that you say that that they don't want drag queens or tra uh, cross dressers under that umbrella, not recognizing uh, when there wasn't quote unquote a name for it that doesn't mean yeah. it didn't exist right yeah so for you to try to um exclude individuals yeah. like what are we doing are we including individuals or are we excluding individuals well, well no, it's, 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 a lot of these folks are basically upset because you know all transsexuals started out as cross dressers And then, exactly. then you realize, and then you realize that, oh, there's something more going on here than just cross dressing. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it's not having yeah. a name. If, if you don't have a word for it, yeah. but you have an action for it, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll find the word eventually, right? Yeah. You yeah. you have to it, accept people for for who they are and let yeah. people live in their truth. Absolutely. Yeah, and so. Those folks that are saying that are probably folks who are triggered because, you know, because they have to, you know, because they haven't come to terms with the fact that, okay, once upon a time, yeah, I used to, yeah, yeah. I used to identify as that, yep. and now I've evolved, quote unquote, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it was Teapot. I don't. I don't know who, but what some group last month had a conversation with trans men and masculine lesbians yeah. and that I couldn't get to. I was really upset because I had to do something else, but I really wanted to sit in on that because it like the inner shit inside the community is just too, yeah. too yeah. shitty, just too much of it. And that like those those are kind of, like okay, like tonight's intergenerational. That's always important, but figuring. Yeah. Get us all to the table to really start talking about what it is and where that shit comes from. But we have yeah. to realize the, spe the spectrum in it all, right? You have to realize there's a spectrum in all of this. It, yes. it, your your journey and, and, and who you are and your identity. There's a why do you have to realize that there's so many folks who won't? There's so many people who yeah. just refuse to realize that. Yeah. Like, okay, Natasha and I, we, we sit on this awful commission the city of hartford's lgbtq plus commission uh, and it yeah months it took for us to, to agree on the name lgbtq plus oh yeah yeah but john mcgarvey like uh, hey we're, do, don't worry, we're, wanna, we're not, do you guys want to collaborate on stuff since i'm new to the human rights commission and at west hartford do you guys want to collaborate with our uh, messiness because oh, I no, heard that yes, we're yes, but not yet. Our shit, we're, we're still at war. We're at war with our mayor's office. We're, okay. we're just straight up at war. You know yeah. that, you know. And let, and let me be honest about, about my situation over here, because I am in West Hartford. Your mayor sucks, Northern, too. Uh, with Connecticut. Um, the thing is, I have her ear. So she, yeah. Juneteenth, if I wouldn't have had her ear, you know what I mean? She, that was she's, awesome. she's very naive awesome. in it. But, um, thank you. Thank you so much. What I'm saying is, uh, I'm not living, when I started the group that I spoke about earlier, Concerned Parents of Color of West Hartford, I, I didn't start it because it was necessarily a, what I would consider a need for me because I get to hide in my middle classness, right? I get to mm -hmm. just yeah. drink wine at noon. I could be a housewife, but I'm also black and, and I recognize I'm black every day. So I'm just like, yeah, I gotta be black now. Um, 
because I've been black <laughs> and I'm a Southern woman. So I was just like, this isn't cutting it for me. Um, I was happy for a while drinking Chardonnay at noon. Trust me. So I, <laughs> I started this group because I was like, uh, these people still don't get it. They don't get it anywhere in this community. And, and my children went to, to school with Luke Bronin's children. So, like I'm saying, I'm not. It's yeah. the, the financial struggle is there. Wow. My 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 child started school with Luke Bronin's children when he got called out for taking them to the Montessori School of Greater Hartford rather than to making them go to school in, in Hartford. And yeah. when I moved up here from the south, you have to recognize when you're from the south. And I don't know if you'll agree or disagree with me, um, Monica. It when you're moving to a place because you want your child to be a foreign education better than a Southern education, because yeah. you deal with a lot more shit. Mm. You're, we go up and we put our, if we can afford to, we're gonna put our children in private schools and white spaces, not thinking past that point because you want those safe spaces, right? When it comes to education. So you come up and you go, yep, you're gonna go here and we're gonna learn Spanish or French and we're gonna be a part of this this multi to do world. AP, you know, AP classes. Yeah, blah, yeah, blah, yeah, blah. right. You know, that's, know that that's, I, that's how my father ended up. That's how my father ended up in communist boarding school, though, because my grandparents moved up from the south, got you know, because knew that sent my dad to school, and then found out that boarding school was important. Went toward a bunch, heard about one that was a school for workers' children. That mm -hmm. sounded good to them because they were workers. And that's where daddy went to school because like Avon Old Farms and shit, like those ones were just too much for them. And yes. my, that's how my father got his communist education. You can ask my mom all the way to back when I was 10, I recognized my blackness and it was like, but I recognized my blackness the way because I, I realized there was inequity in education. I was like, when I have babies, they're going to boarding school. They're going to private school because I just can't handle this public school shit for them because I had come from a predominantly, because I'm a military bred also. So I can come from kind of diverse, but predominantly white spaces. And I moved into where I saw that black students weren't getting an equal education because I was gerrymandered into a school where the people across the street from me went to the white school and I went to the black school. And I was like, what the fuck is this about? Like, what, yeah. are, we, what are we doing here? So I, at age 10, I already had figured it out. So I, when I, at that age, up until I moved up here, I was like, so then I go, okay, well now I'm going to send my child to public school this year. So then my child ends up in the whitest possible public school. There are no teachers of color, no administrators of color, not the janitor ain't even a color. It, it doesn't, the, the lunch lady is not of color, the, nothing. And you I know like, you're in an apple in town when the lunch lady is white. Come on now. And I was like, here we go. So they didn't like it because well, I called them out on it. Because I was like, there aren't any, any black people here, Hispanic, Asian, anyone. Can you hear me? And, and, and I was just like, okay, here we go. So that's what prompted, it had been something waiting to happen for me to start this organization. But it was just like, there is no representation in this town. And y'all keep telling me that we're diverse. I'm like, how can you be diverse? But when, when people look outside, there's nothing that's diverse about their leadership, about their, their school communities and leadership and, 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 and administrations. Like, no, we're, we're not going to rock this. And Kamora will tell you, one week later, Juneteenth happened. We were renaming a piece of land in the next um, three months. Like, no, we're changing curriculums because no. And in... That's why I think Kamora is behind our organization now because she's like, oh, y'all doing shit. Y'all ain't just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not just raising awareness. And not just doing shit because and I can wait, do that in the black And I'm community. sorry, and we're, and and we're not on Facebook Live. Community. And you're not collecting jars of dirt and feeling as if you're honoring. Oh, no, don't. Why you bring yeah. that up? Why you bring that shit up? Don't do that. Boo, do you, you know about the jars them. of dirt that West Hartford has? They got this dirt jar project that's like supposed They're to. They're trying to be like the, the Montgomery. They're trying to be like that initiative. And I'm like, you don't Are they gonna put it on their face? Is that what the initiative is? It's like <laughs> <laughs> it's my they collected oh, jars of dirt. I well I called out we have this program called the Witness Stone Project, which um discovers the enslaved of West Hartford. So I'm I love the the foundation of it. But when they lay these stones, they decide to lay our ancestors in a in a graveyard 
and they uh, and they continue to buy a, a bind them to their enslaver so it says our ancestors names when they lived when they died their occupation and who they were enslaved by and they lay them back in the ground <laughs> so i got into a full argument with the lady the lady who's in charge of this was in my first week of my who has my really nice jewelry fucking name okay my my well, she has well, she's she's the wife of, of of a political, and she's a lesbian, and she she's the self proclaimed town historian, and she's mm. the the know all be all of Black oh. history. I know those. And ladies. I was like, so I called her out on her shit. I said, "You wear slingbacks and has great jewelry." And I just said, "You were binding my ancestors to their enslavers, but you don't seem to think there's an issue with that." And she was like, well, we're, we're trying to dehumanize and humanize. I go, no, 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 no. They are forever linked to their enslavers. You are not giving them any peace as they lay there when you claim to memorialize them. So I don't agree with your project on, on, those, on those terms. And she was not happy with me. She has not been happy with me because a new kid walked into town and was like, well, I think we need to change things because she didn't start Juneteenth. The piece of land that she keeps talking about that sits in the center of our town named after a slave owner she hasn't tried to rename so i just i wrote a simple letter and said these things should probably happen yep. immediately Easily. that's the least that's the least you can do so and i, I have a full it. list of others <laughs> so i live in hey. the the other white suburb of, of hartford there's many white suburbs of hartford yeah. but i live in um south windsor Yes. And um, like my story is very much so um, parents moving from the South in order to go North um, to, to get a better education. And so I grew up in New Orleans for the first 10 years of my life. And it was great because what people don't know about New Orleans is it's pretty much little Saigon. And there's Vietnamese people everywhere. Everyone that I went to school with looked like me. Um, I knew all their parents, like I knew everything about my community. And then I get to South Windsor and there's nothing but white people. And I like start freaking out. And and my mom couldn't for the life of her understand why I was having trouble adjusting because she sees that, you know, there's music classes here and um, school trips and, and there's opportunity. So I think that does get lost in, in the experience. Um, that, that we want children to have, that education is great, and don't get me wrong, I love the education that I got in South Windsor. It's got me to a lot of places, and I appreciate everything that I learned, because I wouldn't have learned it in the past, probably, but it comes at a cost. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I will apologize to you now, because I have been a parent. I'm a parent of a seven-year-old that I'm sure everyone saw in my business, and I, <laughs> I failed him. Um, and I'm married to a white woman, but I failed him and in, in thinking that he was coming to something better. I still don't want to be in Florida. Please trust me on that. I will take this over racism, um, over Florida, Florida racism, but I, um, failed him in his education because he wasn't, he didn't get his whole education. So I'm happy that I caught it young enough so that he will now get his whole education. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. In terms, yeah, in my case, I was fortunate in that my mom's undergrad degree was in history. <laughs> mm -hmm. And my godmother uh, founded the local chapter of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. So, I was immersed in black history from the time I was five years old. So and I was too, and I still had it wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> That's my yeah. Issue. <laughs> I still had it wrong as a, a kid that I thought I knew it. I'm like, here we go. Because, Listen. you know, when you're in the NAACP realm, you're going, we need the best education, we need orders, we need, we need the Barack Obamas, we need them to go and, 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 and <coughs> indulge in these white spaces. <coughs> what we need to do is support our community. Yeah. Look, I broke my child. So, so when I was in sixth grade, I lived in Hartford, and when I was in sixth grade, my parents decided to 
it was time to jump into white flight along with everyone else in the neighborhood. So, cause we lived in Blue Hill, so it was like an intentional mixed community. So I was like, up until 1983, I was in this ideal black, white, ethnic white, um, ethnic black, just like us, right? And, yeah. and, and the Jews, and the Jews, right? Mm-hmm. And then my then it just like turned and all kinds of awful shit because of city zoning and all that other shit happened. So we moved out to Summers where we had lots of land and a river and all this great shit and racism every fucking day at school all day. And so then, boom, parents got divorced, moved back to Harvard, did it, all this good shit. I had Joseph. When he was in sixth grade, I moved his ass up to Ipswich, Mass., where we had a beautiful house, great land, all this wonderful shit, and I subjected my child to racism. So I did it fucking consciously. And so, like, we we started going to um, an AME church in Lynn. So that was, like, way, but it, it... Get, kept him a connection to a black community, right? And yeah. he's a, so he was drumming in church. So like, I was feeling good about this. However, what he was getting was the hypocrisy of the black mm-hmm. church. Joseph's, yeah. like, Joseph's complete cynicism towards anything black and and reeking of Christianity at all. I that's completely my making. And trying Isn't it to wild? Be- Consciously, and I. What you just said, consciously, I moved him into a white space. I, I wasn't dumb about where I was moving him to, and my <laughs> wife wasn't dumb, even being a white woman, because my wife is the one who goes and finds every Black business for, we got a Black uh, chiropractor, we got a Black masseuse, we got a Black, th- and she's the one who's like, I'm finding them, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that our community supported because she feels as if she's, you know, she's a part of this community. She's raising a child, a, a black child. So she uh-huh. wants him to see, he, she believes in the representation of him, right? So, yeah. but it's again, again, Kamora, you're absolutely right. The conscious, we did it consciously. Like, we think this is what you should have. Yep. Yes. And then we go, we'll all be damned. <laughs> How it is not- unfortunate that the choice has to be made between education and and supporting your truth, like you, just, mm-hmm. like you would think that those two would go together so easily. But it, it's we a, lived it's ten a- minutes from the beach. We lived ten minutes from Cranes Beach, which is every year voted one one of the top five beaches. Very often, it's the top number one beach, but it's always in the top five beaches of New England. That was ten minutes away. I could drop mm-hmm. at, at school, go to the beach, do my walk on the beach, go home. But then there was racism and it just kept like, we lived in the woods. We had beautiful, like my morning walks were glorious and we lived way out enough that usually no one went by me. But then again, as I'm on my glorious walk, if anyone drove by and they didn't know me, if they knew me as me, it was great. I got a pass because I wasn't a black woman. I was Cammy. Sheila's granddaughter, Priscilla's daughter, right? But if they didn't know me, I was this random, and there had to be like a slowdown and a look and a. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Put a... Yeah, put some of the pillows on the floor. Yeah, I mean it's it's wild, like you said, um, to have to make a decision between a whole education and and. A, and a good education, right? <laughs> that's that, that's what you're trying. You want your child to have the best, but what does the best entail? And that's what I've been asking edu- educators this past week, you know, on these anti-racist curriculum that everyone is claiming that they want to have. But what is the best education? What how, what does an anti-racist curriculum actually look like to you? Well, does it deal with representation? Does it deal with dealing with people's histories? Are we, are we bringing in more voices of color. At what point, what, what is a good education to you? If it's a true anti-racist curriculum. You do it every a, year. Huh, I, I was gonna say, if it's, a, if it's a good anti-racist curriculum, there's a different curriculum for the black children and the white children and the children of color. And that is the only way it can truly be an anti-racist curriculum because there's no way your black children and your white children, A, need to learn the same shit, and B, need to learn it together. And just 
talked about in sixth grade, when you were in sixth grade and you had to do sex ed, they separated the boys and the girls because there was different shit to be talking about. The black kids don't need to be the guinea pigs facilitating the white kids' understanding of anti-racism. The, the, if, if we're really gonna have an anti-racist society, we don't start the black kids off with, this is what white people think about you, and this is how you can help your white friends not think this about you. That's not anti-racist. No, no, that's, and also you have to look at the fact of uh, equalizing funding. Because one of the interesting things about, um, that I learned about the education system in Ontario is that it's all the tax money is pooled. So Thank you. It's all, it's Thank all you. pooled. So, and then it's doled out by the provincial government. You know, because, you know, the problem that we have in the United <laughs> States is that, you know, your, the funding, education funding is based on zip codes. Yes, you either do a county by county or town by town, and then every and then they don't understand where that would qualify as an uh, uh, equity in education. When your neighborhood town who might not have as much money as you doesn't isn't getting the sufficient amount of resources, yeah. you should be. I and I was just talking to, to about this today. When if I wanted my child to go to the next town over, then there should be no blurb in his education, right? There should be no, there's nothing. He shouldn't miss anything. Everyone's supposed to be on the same level. And when you do that, when you, when you, because Connecticut's known for it, they actually passed, if I'm not mistaken, laws to make it sure because the disparity rate between, um, like let's go to down to Greenwich, between Greenwich and, 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 and Bridgeport is so vast. Oh. But they were like, we don't want our town funds to go to Bridgeport. So Bridgeport has an awful educational situation where uh, Greenwich has something that people probably, you know, in other states feed off of and emulate. So it's always amazing that, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, I believe in equity and education. I'm like, well, then give your money away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> give so your difficult. money away. So an example of that is so when I when my when my mom brought us up here, um, we lived in my aunt's living room for like six months um, because we had um, no connections here except for them. Um, couldn't find an apartment. Couldn't find a house yet. So if you're familiar with this area, Buckland Hills Mall is like right on the edge of the South Windsor Manchester line. So when we found an apartment, we f we found an apartment. Um, across from Buckland Hills, right over the Manchester line. I could walk to South Windsor in about 30 seconds. But someone in the town found out. They kicked me out of the South Windsor school system, and they sent me to Manchester Public Schools. And I was in there for a week, and my mom said, oh, no, 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 you're not staying there. And we had to move literally 100 feet over across the town line and mm -hmm. the disparity in the education between the two towns is yep. mind-boggling. Yep. Crazy. When we moved back to Hartford, when we moved back from Ipswich, we moved to, we moved first, we moved just right across the line. We moved to Oakwood Ave. And we moved to the, like, if you saw how I gerrymandered us moving, I knew exactly where the Hall High line was. And we were mm -hmm. only looking for apartments within the Hall High district. Then we moved over to King Philip. But the, the beginning was like, nope, we're going, we're moving back to Hartford. I've got to be back in Hartford. I've got to do work in Hartford, but my kid is not going to Hartford schools. And the school he's going to go to in West Hartford, Joseph's a jazz kid, we're going to Hall. Yeah, yeah, right? It, it, <laughs> again, conscious and intentional of where you want your, your kids to be. I'm, I'm going to have to bounce out. So. Miss Monica Roberts, woman, thank you so much. So, yes, so, so what I was saying right before and bounce out, but we are going to do something for your 60th birthday. There's got to be something where I'll get in touch with, what do you call it, NBJ, uh, JC, David Bush. David Johns, yeah. Yeah, David Johns, but some, something's got to be done for your 60th birthday. 
Yeah, tell sure. us what cake you want. We have until 2022. <laughs> See, that gives me time. I'm planning a retreat in 2023. Thank See. God. We'll, hopefully, we'll have a vaccine come yes. 20, 2022 yeah, so that you. we can be amongst each other. And tell your Texas folks to start wearing their mask and stop messing with yes. around about it. But, um, that, but, that would be more so the Texas Republicans that ain't wearing the mask. Yeah, yeah. Tell their asses to, to put on their damn mask. That's and again, crazy. I'm like, y'all don't want to put the mask on. F y'all. Y'all want to yeah. die COVID? Be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> That's less well, Republican folks. Yeah. That's less I, Republican I watched votes. a little bit of that Mount Rushmore stuff and just kind of thought that, like, well... They die if they. Yeah. But they need to die at home. And yeah. if you want to be yeah. sick and stupid, stay at home because you don't deserve good doctors working on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially when you when you thought this was a hoax anyway. Right. So. Yep. Okay, wait. All right, so you. Folks, good later. night. All right. Come on, love Bye. you. That was nice being you. Okay, so does anyone remember? Wait, what's the name of that Netflix documentary? Because we're about to sign off. Completely. Disclosure. 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 Another show I want to suggest to you, uh, Kamora, Legacy. Like Legacy. Natasha, who is behind you? That's beautiful. I've been meaning to ask all that night. That is Sylvia Rivera. Who did that? I don't know. It's a cover, a cover of a book that was written about her. That's I love it. Her. Yeah, I've been looking at it this whole time, Natasha. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, but check out Legendary. Legendary or it's Legacy? Legendary. Legacy. 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 What's it and about? It's a um, complete series on HBO. It's a real competition between houses. Okay. Oh. Is that HBO? Yeah. Yep. Me and Olu will love that. Olu is going to, that's, yeah, that sounds like fun. They're competing. Legacy and Disclosure. Dollars. Yeah. I hear Disclosure, you need to be ready for, like, you Oh, need yes, to, you do. <laughs> like. Oh, I'm in. I'm in. Harley knows about Disclosure. <laughs> So disclosure isn't a nice fun just put on before I go to bed movie. No. Actually, no. you want you want to be you want to be alive, aware, and in, and you want to be up for this. Because yeah. You, so because you going like you going here. No. Tomorrow, you, I still no. might watch it. I still might watch it tonight. But I'm thinking maybe y'all. I got I got a big screen in the backyard, so I, I'm thinking we still might have to put it on in the backyard. Let's figure out. Let's figure out an evening when that can happen. You know, and, with you know, you know, Hamilton one night and and and, <laughs> and the show is Alexander called. Hamilton. Mm, mm. My name is Alexander gonna Hamilton. Never going to be president. No, never going to be. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Never no, gonna I want, be I actually, hey, damn. Full disclosure, <laughs> I saw it live twice with the original cast. <laughs> I saw really? I saw it in Chicago. Yes. I sent my mom up here in Hartford. Me and my mom tried every single day. And I'm pissed because Whoopi Goldberg called it the first day she was on The View. She said, you guys are going to miss out. There's this show. It's the best show I've ever seen. And I told my mom the next day. And then we didn't make it. And then, but my God. Wow. Yeah, we watch it on the big screen. We, I mean, I'm where there's literally a movie screen in my backyard no. set up. And my yeah. wife did a, built a whole True. thing. No, the wild thing is I got to see it for free. Oh, I got oh, to see it. Right, full time. I got I got to see it. Well, once, well, once was a trade for tickets. Once oh. was a trade. Somebody wanted to. I had tickets for UConn Stanford women's basketball. Well, I would have traded you too. And, I and somebody you and too. somebody said, "I'll I'll take those tickets right. in exchange for these tickets," and they were Hamilton tickets. And no, and they were the original wow. cast. No, so this was that game. This was Lin only Mon athletes get that. Only athletes is, get this what you're talking Lin about, Carly. What? That they traded Hamilton tickets for UConn Stanford. Yes, I only in Connecticut. <laughs> only, only in Connecticut. Wow. Well, you know they yeah. televise those games, and they rec you can record. No, 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 no. no UConn no, Stanford. Like Stanford. If you're a, if you're a, if you're a if you're a Connecticut fan, and and you can heckle Tara Vanderveer for forty minutes. Absolutely. You're going to do it because yeah. they hate. Yeah. Well, and honestly, the there. thing is, that's my second favorite team. So I'm just there in awe of everything that's going on, because Stanford's about one of the only teams that can be Connecticut at Gamble. So that that's a that's a game you want to be at. When is that? When does that happen? Um, when the when did that happen? Here, the Akuma Caves were here. Oh yeah, they uh, 
Oh, they got their one. They got their one win against win. UConn. They got their one. Win. No, they've had they've had more than one. But at Gamble, that was their their win against UConn. Hey, Mark Vanderbilt, though, they offensive they genius. I will never forget the uh-huh. one game. I'll never forget the one game because I'll admit, I've met Tara Vanderveer. I respect Tara Vanderveer. I She's an don't. offensive genius. And until she plays a team that can defend them well. Yeah, well, because she has to deal with what she has to deal with. That's what we talk about it in recruiting. You know, your you know the athletes are going to go to Berkeley, Stanford, Ivy League schools. They don't ever have to recruit because those kids can only get those are the only kids that can get in. So if you get the top that can get in, then you get in the. See, you get the best a, of the best. See, here's my thing, though. Here's the only thing about Stanford. Remember, first one to lose to a 16. <laughs> first, one seed, first one seed to lose to a 16. Now, granted, they have a few excuses. But, no, I traded the tickets for Hamilton tickets. Very cool. cool. Rebecca didn't uh, there. Because how different would things be? Because that's where her parents wanted her to go. Who was that? Rebecca. No, good thing if, she's a good thing she's a New England girl. She would have made mm-hmm. it. She had the grades to go. She's an yeah. all-American. Oh, here you go. Hold on one second. Y'all, y'all talking about Rebecca, right? Y'all talking about yep. Rebecca, right? Mm-hmm. Hold on. Oh, I can't. I can't. Oh, I can't flip it. You see? Can you see her up there? I can see her. Heck, I used to work with her. I produced hey. her for a year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. produced Rebecca at, at for a year at ESPN. Love Did you? Rebecca. I re- love yeah. me some Rebecca Lobo. Yeah, yeah, that, that's my original. That's my you original. You were at Carly? I did for 18 years. Oh, gosh. Why didn't I know you? I got some Disney tickets. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, right? I used to have them. I used to get the, oh, I had a Disney Silver Pass. I could go down there. I could go down there with three friends, get World Hopper Passes for free. Wow. Boom. That's what that's we used like to get. $2,000. That, those are $300 just by themselves. The, right. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you, after 9-11 hit, you could, I could, do a, you could do a whole Disney weekend for $300 total. Mm-hmm. I'm talking mm-hmm. flight. I'm talking flight, resort, park tickets for a weekend. That's amazing. And you could do that for because they yeah. wanted people. No, they were begging people to go to the park. In the, if yeah. like for three years after 9 11, they got so Disney took such a bad. People don't realize here's the thing about Disney that people got to understand from all of the, the, the number one why Disney is as big as it is now is ESPN because when after, because after 9 11, Disney and they put the world sports Disney, when they put the center in there. They no, put that before center. that, no, forget the oh. center. The center, actually, they took a bath on. The Disney Wide World of Sports, they took a bath on it. They lose money on it. It's okay. a tax okay. write-off. What, the thing about, here's the thing. When, di, when I first got, when I first started working at ESPN, the stock price was $8 a share. Mm-hmm. After, after, um, after 9-11, it was still it, it it perked up a little bit, then it dropped off. I mean, you could get Disney stock for like three, four dollars a share. By the time I left Disney, that that was a hundred dollars a share. <laughs> that was a hundred dollars. <laughs> but here's the thing: Disney for a long time took up the only. There was only one part of Disney that, for years after 9/11, was the only part of Disney that made money was ESPN. ESPN was a license to print. Interesting, love that. I love that all, knowledge. Thank all you. the stuff, all the stuff you see now. They bought Pixar because ESPN made those record profits all those years. That's what helped Disney buy Pixar, buy Marvel, buy Marvel. ABC was in the toilet for years. ABC was the number four network for yeah. years until, until they got, then they got lost and they helped them. Then basically they became Shondaland television. <laughs> that's what, no, that's what, no. Scandal no. Save, before Scandal, did you say a black woman saved them? Did you Pretty say much. that out loud? Pretty much. Shondaland is saying, Shonda, see, that's what all these networks are doing now. They're saying, look, they're saying, look, we, they, they saw what AB, ABC basically told Shonda here. Here's a night. Program it. Oh, yeah. And, they're all and, trying to, they're and all three, trying to get and, and they right just, now. Because, no. It's, and Ava. I mean, Shonda, they say, hey, Shonda, here, okay, we liked Grey's Anatomy. You know what? Program the whole damn night. Oh yeah, Gray scan, Gray scan on murder. Ava. They can't touch Ava oh. and they can't touch Lena because they they went a different direction and Ava. Yeah, 
You want to know how bad you want to know how bad yeah. scandal was at the beginning? The NFL was ready to cancel Thursday night football because nobody's watching it. <laughs> they were I ready to, they were ready to drop my that. soap opera. I'm not kidding. People, I'd be like, scandal Thursday night foot. <laughs> and can't... that's why we're going to Vermont this weekend. We're going to make jam. I'm yes. going to mm, I'm, I can't cope without Pope. There you go. <laughs> I can't. I was like, I, I'd be in and the that's I would, I'm fine with a glass of wine for dinner. Yeah. I would have been, no, my attitude, here was me on a Friday morning after that Thursday night game. Did you, you didn't watch the Thursday night game? Hell, I'm in a sports center meeting. They're like, you didn't watch the Thursday night football game. No, I didn't. What? Scandal. Like, <laughs> I was like, what do you think was I'm like, doing? I'm doing I was what like, the rest scandal. of the world is doing. I don't care about, mm. I don't care about the Packers against the, I don't care about the Packers and the Jaguars. Who cares? But Carly, I want to look at, <laughs> I want to look at Olivia Pope for, I want to see what Olivia Pope wearing this week. I want, yes. to see, I want to see her in that. I want to see her in that twelve hundred dollar Burberry trench, white trench coat that that Macy sold Come out on. of. Macy's at West Farm sold out of that mug the next day. Yeah, <laughs> so, really, really? Like, they had like six of them. They were gone at twelve hundred dollars oh, each. So funny. <laughs> if yeah. there was a white trench coat, even if it was a knockoff, it was gone. <laughs> You could I would have loved to have had her entire wardrobe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that shit was badass. I agree. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna get but, I'm gonna get off this call. I, yeah. I no, we gotta do Adrian, we have to do lunch sometime. Yes. Yes. The two of you and, and the two of you and Monica though, the three of you really need to get together and do like figure out some wonderful black woman, trans woman sports thing and get that going. Like like you okay, Carly, you know exactly who Monica is. Adrian, Google. Just Google Monica Oh, Rock. you know, it's already written down. You know I've been writing this entire time. Oh, yeah. Um, Actually, Google the three of them. Actually, Google the four of us. We, like, yeah, we've been doing shit for mm. over a decade. We've been having a ball. I appreciate all of you. I um, can't even <laughs> tell you how much I needed this um, to be in the space with you guys. Um, I've been doing, I haven't slept in a month and I just needed this space to just be. And I um, I just so appreciate you, all of you for being here and listening and, and speaking and, and talking about your experiences. And um, I hope the other people uh, that were on here, individuals, uh, I hope they know that. Tomorrow will pass it on, I'm sure. But thank you, thank you. Thank Love you, you girl. A lot from you. Night, y'all. All right. Be good, be amazing. Boo, sleep well. Carly, do amazing things. Be great, folks. I'm trying. Good yes. night, y'all. Stay 